to you. Just change. Morning, right, Brother Brian. Good afternoon. Yes, yes I saw, I'm sorry. Good afternoon, Brother Brian. Let's do that right. Uh, good morning, Chris. <laughs> there we are. All right. <laughs> we got it right. Brother Manny, good to see you, brother. Good morning. And, and our other brother, Smith, our uh, guest speaker in a few weeks. Good to see you, brother. And Brother Buck, welcome to you. You're on mute, brother. Still on mute. <laughs> How about now? There you are. How you doing, brother? <laughs> I'm well. Welcome from the Isle of Man. Ah, indeed. What a manly island it is. Good to have you here. <laughs> oh, really? oh, dear. <laughs> hey, what do you want? That's set the tone anyway, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, come on. When I was a kid, I remember seeing, we were playing Dungeons and Dragons or something. Somebody had some maps of England that we were using as like the background maps, and I saw the Isle of Man. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, the three-legged flag. Yes. <laughs> I was explaining to my son just last night that, you know, when I was growing up, we didn't have Google. We didn't have an easy way to, you know, look things up if we didn't know what they were. And a whole bunch of things when I was younger, I had no idea. And the first time I stumbled across them, I was like, what the heck is that? Nowadays, it's like, oh, you did it. Oh, okay, it's that. And you can Google it and understand it and be aware of it. Back then, it's like, I don't know. I don't know. Like, the only man's got the oldest parliament in the world. Is that right, Alan? Yeah, it's the oldest continuous parliament. Ah, right. the, the United Kingdom parliament is actually a little older. But of course, uh, during the time of Oliver Cromwell, it was, um, it was suspended for three or four years. So ours is the oldest continuous parliament. That's cool. Uh, Brother Patrick, you want to uh, show your face and say hello? <laughs> and Brother Carson Smith isn't, uh, I see your pick, but I don't see you yet. If you want to at least turn on your camera for a sec so we can see you and say hello. Right here. Yeah, that'd be right. Hello again, Brother Raymond. Brother Carson, you're unmuted, but I don't hear you. Okay, we'll give you a minute. <laughs> right, do you get the feeling that people are just ignoring you? Yes, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Here, Alan, did you hear something then? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I see it. <laughs> I'm the one person who can do something about it. Well, I guess Brian can too. You can kick people, can't you, Brian? I can certainly kick people, yeah. Okay, good, all right. So yeah, I can at least do that if you all annoy me. <laughs> Brother Aud, I, I'm butchering your name. Aud, good to have you. Awad. Oh, there's Brother Patrick. Hello, Brother Patrick. Why don't you unmute and introduce yourself? Hello, Adi. How y'all doing? I'm doing good down here in Mississippi. Oh, Mississippi. Outstanding. Good to have you. <laughs> Yeah, we've met Moses before down here. All right. <laughs> Brother Carson Smith, I still haven't heard from you. You want to say hello? I see you're unmuted, but we haven't heard you. Maybe your mic's too low. He's just sitting there reading his book. <laughs> I, I assume he's taking his obligation there. That's what it looks like. <clears throat> Thank you. 
See, at least when I take a break, see, at least tell I'm taking a cigar break. That's why I'm going. See, I'm going <laughs> to have the smoke and then I come back. <laughs> that picture was actually from, uh, I was on a ship in the uh, Elizabeth River here in Norfolk. Uh, this is our, the last Demolay event that was pre-COVID. So I was sitting there on the second deck having a cigar. Uh, it's like we did a little cruise. We had a dinner and they had a ceremony and all this. And we had like a couple hours where they just sort of wandered around the boat, looked out at things and stuff. So I was outside, so it was okay to have a smoke. It was shortly after that that COVID took away all the fun. So I like that as my profile pic. <laughs> and people always ask me, what kind of cigar is that? And stuff. I've had one person say, you shouldn't be smoking at a Demolay event. Like, well, I was outside. <laughs> I don't know. Some people are stuffier than others. Brother Awad is from Qatar. Qatar. Try to say it right. Qatar. <laughs> it's not Qatar. <laughs> uh, it is. It is Qatar. Good evening, everyone. Qatar. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I'm in <laughs> in Qatar. <laughs> Good to have you. It's not Qatar, that's for sure. <laughs> Speaking of the Isle of Man, I think quarter, I think quarter is on the Isle of Man. I'm not sure. I know little about geography. <laughs> hey, well, how do we friends and influence people? Eh? That's right. We just, yep. we're just making it up as we go along here, as you can tell. Brother Harpold, good to see you again. Good to see you this morning. Mm. So uh, I'm gonna. I'm waiting on uh, Brother uh, Gomez to join us. Um, so I'm gonna start with a question. And we're just sort of passing around the room, and uh, just we, we we did. By the way, we're gonna do another um, Masonic Mania in the future, and hopefully get a bigger attendance. But I figure I'll just throw out one question to the conversation going well before we get to our speaker. Um, as far as uh, to be one, ask one, and whether you can recruit people for masonry. So I'm just going to go around the room and just ask you, in your experience, in, you, in your Grand Lodge, what's the policy and are you able to, what you consider to be recruiting, or how far can you go and what can you say to someone? So let's start with Brother Hughes. Well, it's just not something I would do. What I mean, official policy, like what are you allowed to do? Are you allowed to, what would you consider, like would you mention, say to your son, you know, would you talk about masonry? Let's, let's get a focus on that. Like a family member, somebody you already know. Would you mention <laughs> masonry or would you keep it a total secret until they ask? I wouldn't do it. Hmm? I, wouldn't, I wouldn't wish to do it. You wouldn't say anything? No. So you would wait for your son to ask you yes. before you consider. Okay. Brother Den Boer. I, uh, I'm Dave Dambor. I'm a Fellcraft here yes. in Houston, Texas. And as a Fellcraft, I was always taught that you, you don't mention like Freemasonry, like unless someone asks you about it. My okay. family, you know, I'm a Lewis. So, you know, my family knows more about the group and, you know, we're very familiar with it, but I was just always told unless someone asked about it, like you, know, you, you don't mention it. it's not like a secret. It's not a cult. It's more okay. just wait until someone just, you know, asks you the question. Okay. Brother Brian, I'm sure you're England civil ever. What is, what is the, more or less the, poly I guess this is more of a personal thing. What, what would you consider yeah. appropriate? Um, either. <clears throat> I don't make any secret of, not, of uh, not being a Freemason, so I'm quite open with it. But I've got a sticker on my car, which for the UK is unusual. Yes. <laughs> um, if, anyone, if it comes up in the conversation, I'm quite happy to talk about it as and when. Um, if I think someone's worthy, then I'll certainly invite them along to a, an evening meal at the lodge okay. and let the other brethren sign them out. All right. Very good. Brother Buck. Uh, although the Isle of Man is not part of the UK, we are a part of the United Grand Lodge of England. And my understanding is that we're um almost encouraged to speak about our own freemasonry okay good well so what country does the isle of man fall under the isle of man is your your own country <laughs> okay then yeah 
<laughs> All right, then. <laughs> Is there a difference of opinion here, Brother Brown? <laughs> it's completely independent from the UK, apart from um, defence, basically. Okay, very interesting. Would that be right, fair, Alan? Yeah, I think that's fair. We haven't got too many nuclear subs. <laughs> but you'd be happy to loan them if needed. <laughs> yeah. <kind> of guy. <laughs> yeah. Brother Frankel, what do you say? It's a member of your family, people you know. Are you open about masonry within your family? Would your, If you have sons, would they know you're a mason? Would you kind of keep it a secret, expect them to ask you before you bring it up? Oh, I have four daughters. <laughs> Uh, but I do have grandsons, and uh, um, it's certainly no secret that I'm a Mason and a Shriner. They come to the parades when I'm in a parade as a flyer in the Shriners. Um, we have uh, family events in the past until COVID, such as pancake breakfasts. We go uh, off into different pancake breakfasts at lodges around here, and my family joins me there. And this past summer, um, my grandson asked and I was uh, privileged to raise my grandson um, through the three degrees this past summer. He's a uh, senior at Coastal Carolina in mechanical engineering um, and uh, now he has been accepted to the doctoral program at uh, George Washington University um, but is uh, very happy to be a Mason. You're, I mean, mu you're muted, Chris. Yeah, I, I, I was burping, so I muted myself briefly. <laughs> Brother Gomez, uh, good to have you here. Good morning, brethren. Uh, good afternoon for some of our brothers across the pond. <laughs> yeah, good to have you here. We're just chatting a bit before we introduce you, but good to see you here. I see you're in your studio. <laughs> I'm actually at work. This is my second Zoom from work. I've been here for 17 hours. I did one last night for the Eastern Star in New York, and I'm I just got off work after a 17-hour shift here at the George Washington Bridge. Uh, I just got off a call. I was thought I was going to be a little late, but I was able to get out of it quick. Well, we're, we're, we're fine. We don't, we don't start right on time. <laughs> well, we start <laughs> early, but we don't kick out the program right on time. I want to give everybody a chance to – because we have people dribbling in for the first few minutes, and I don't want people joining in the middle of your talk. So we usually wait a few minutes to get in. Um, uh, iPad 8, you want to say hello? I know people can't always control what they're – their Zoom says for them. So I'm sure there's a brother hiding behind that iPad. <laughs> Whoever just joined, iPad 8. <laughs> okay, iPad 8 is unmuted. Uh, and we'll start video later. Okay. No, I'm, tr I'm trying to get there. We go. Ah, there you are. I know him. <laughs> yeah, Mark Irwin from uh, Ontario, Canada. That's right. Good to see you, brother. Temple Lodge. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm starting to yeah. actually recognize people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just got a new iPad, so I'm just working on renaming it. Okay, fair enough. Uh, <laughs> brother, oh, I just left. No, there is Rushbrook. Sorry, people are coming and going. I'm trying to keep an eye on people. Brother Rushbrook, I, you want to say hello? I was just, so I'm not a brother and I'm oh. not a man, and I was just typing into the chat to ask if it was okay for me to be here. Uh, uh, yes, we are open. Uh, okay. What brings you then, if I might ask? I run a study abroad program in Cuba in the summer. And a few years ago, I had a student from Jordan who was a Mason, who met um, Masons when he was down there, took a couple of days off of the program to get to know the people at the lodge and what was there. And that had sparked my interest. But if it's not good for me to be here, I'm happy. I'm fine. Oh, no. We're, we're, we're kind of open. Um, one of the uh, issues that we've, some of us have run into, Brian, uh, is <laughs> in some areas uh, they talk about lodge uh, online meetings being vetted and online meeting being open, whatever. I can't, um, there's no way for me to verify that all of you are actually regular Masons. And even if you are, my Grand Lodge may not recognize your Grand Lodge. So I think it's folly to say, I'm having a tiled meeting online for a whole host of technical reasons. I can't have a tiled meeting online. This is not secret. Anyone can see this and any of the papers that we present online or the topics we discuss, anyone should be able to see. I think generally they're only interesting to Masons, but 
anyone can have access to them. So I'm not overly concerned about um, restricting access to these meetings so far. I'm kind of- Plus this, uh, this lecture is, uh, all my lectures are open to anybody. So I'm not talking about anything secret. So uh, Absolutely. Uh, I, have, I, I speak to everybody, it doesn't matter. So you're more than welcome on my end to join, it doesn't matter. Okay. Great, oh. thank you. I, I'd rather I'd rather be inclusive than exclusive at the moment. And uh, until so many of my grand laws yells at me and tells me I have to change, then I'm kind of going with that policy. So, um, and uh, let's see, I was going to say something. Oh, yeah. Um, let me do the. Uh, uh, Normally, where does, uh, when, you, when we do, when you guys do meet, where do you meet? Uh, oh, I was, oh, yeah. I'm, I, I should have, I guess there's enough people here. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is Virginia Research Lodge, number 1777's weekly unstated Zoom. Our research lodge is based out of Highland Springs, which is near Richmond in Virginia. And we meet about four times a year. And since COVID, uh, we haven't been able to meet in person. So instead of stated meetings, I've started these unstated meetings. And I try to have them every Saturday, uh, which is when we normally have our, um, our meetings, which would be like, in, we just have, would have had one in February, in fact, uh, a couple weeks ago. So yes, we normally meet in Richmond and that's why we do this. So there's my formal introduction to everybody. Good to have you all here. <laughs> also, could you make me, uh, my brother, when you make me a co-host so I can share my screen after you? Oh, absolutely. Yes. I need to do that. Let's see. Um, Co-host, I think. Uh, time. Okay. Yep. I think you should have rights to do that. I was going to post. Uh, dang, where did you go? Um, I was going to post the links to our uh, website and Facebook group, but I didn't have it on front of my computer. So give me a sec. I will find that. I gotta remember where I stuck it. <laughs> um, I think it's notes, sticky notes, that's it. There you are. Um, so as I mentioned, we are, uh, this is being hosted by Virginia Research Lodge. And I'm putting here in the chat for everyone, that is our Facebook group and you're all welcome to join it. And then our <coughs> website and then my email address. Um, Virginia Research Lodge has a Facebook group and we have over 1,500, I think almost 1,600 members now. And it's open to Masons. We encourage Masons. We're not really strict. We allow, there's members of the Masonic family who are in there as well. Um, and we offer weekly research papers from our archives that I've been scanning and emailing out to our mailing list. <clears throat> if you want to join the mailing list, you need to message me or email me directly, and I'll put you on the list. Joining our group does not automatically put you on the mailing list. But they do get posted to the group every week, too, if you just want to read them there. But I email them out as well. And, uh, of course, we have these weekly meetings. Brother Brian and others will post other Masonic Zoom meetings on there frequently. So if you're looking for Zoom yeah. meetings, uh, we want our group to be a, a clearinghouse for them. If you're looking for something to do online, Masonically, we're doing our best to promote as many things as we can and make that available. Because... Uh, uh, people there's definitely an interest in going to Masonic uh, type Zoom meetings here. So we want to encourage that. So if you want to post something, please post it in the chat. Please join our group if you want to um, promote your event. We welcome it. I want to make this as welcome to as many people as possible. So, and I see a lot of newer people. So this is good. I see people I haven't seen here before. Um, still haven't heard Brother Smith. I think he said he was trying to connect. He's having trouble with his audio. He can hear us, but he okay. can't. Very good. Oh, can't, so he can hear us, but he can't speak to us. Sorry. I understand. Okay. Is, is that a filter I could put on anyone? I mean, let me see if I can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can hear me, but I don't have to hear that. Mute doesn't seem to stick uh, sometimes. Uh, Brother Cruz, give your hand up. Yes, yes. Uh, I just want to say greetings from Hiram Lodge 23 over at New York, uh, PHA. Um, I'm very excited to, to listen to today's uh, lecture. Um, being a Latino, I wanna I would love to see um, Masonry's influence in uh, the <laughs> Latino world. Very good. Well, good to have you here. Um, and uh, yes, I will be introducing Brother Gomez in a in a minute or two. We have over 20 people. I'm gonna wait and see if we get a few more because, like I said, people tend to dribble in, and I don't want to be in the middle <laughs> of and inviting people in. Um, so if you don't mind, Brother Gomez, no, that's fine. Good to see you. I'm glad that's to fine. see you, by the way. 
I've, I've known you online for a long time and it's great to see you almost in person. This is cool. So I feel like half my life is on social media now. I yeah, know. I, know. I know how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and at least this um, COVID actually has done some small beneficial things in that we're, uh, we have more of these online meetings. People are more interested in doing them. And I think I get more of an opportunity to connect with brothers <laughs> online. <laughs> I need to, I'm going to go ahead and mute a few people because some people are coughing. So <laughs> I'm just going to mute a few. Sorry. If you need to speak, go ahead and unmute. But somebody was hacking up along there, so I had to mute you all. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> And of course, once we uh, once we start uh, the talk, we ask everybody to please stay muted during our actual talk. Um, and anyway, I lost my train of thought. Oh yeah, I think it's awesome that I have this opportunity to bring our research papers to the world, but also to meet so many brothers from all around the world online in these weekly meetings. I think that's really cool. I have more people from other countries than I have from Virginia. That's my own research lodge on these chats. <laughs> and as much as I encourage my brothers to attend, uh, I'm pretty much the one running the show on behalf of my research lodge. I, I invite the make a point of inviting them, but they do pop in on occasion. But it's pretty much me. So I, I'm just I'm going to my audience. I mean, my audience seems to be online people and other people in other countries. So I think that's great. And I'm glad to talk to you all and learn about other countries. Uh, that's one of our regular things we're doing is these panel discussions. We had one on the Philippines and brother Manny who dropped and is coming back. Uh, oh, there he is. Okay. Brother Manny was one of our uh, guest panelists where we talked about masonry in the Philippines. I think it was actually just last week. And we're going to have one coming up about Scotland where I have several brothers from Scotland who I've asked to participate and um, take part in that. And basically it's a panel discussion. So that's where I have six or seven brothers who are from a specific country, and I just ask them questions about masonry in that country, and we kind of contrast and compare to what it's like, as opposed to, say, Virginia or most American lodges, which I find are pretty similar in alignment. You look at most American lodges, we're all kind of the same in how we do things uh, with some minor variances, but it's really neat to see how other masons in other countries do business and what they, they think is normal. And then we say, wait, what? You do what? It's always a lot of fun because you're all Masons. You're all doing regular Masonic things. What's normal to you? And it's kind of interesting to see what you do. And we say, wow, we're not like that in any way. That's kind of weird. All right, Brother Smith is coming back. Um, I do want to announce about what's coming up. Uh, I did have Brother Carson Smith lined up as our speaker. He's in here twice now. Okay. <laughs> Um, he's going to be our speaker in April. I have another obligation next Saturday, so I won't be able to host. So we will not have a Zoom meeting next Saturday. The Saturday after that, which is the 20th, I will be speaking about cryptic masonry and the cryptic council, those degrees, in Virginia Research Royal Arch Chapter. Our research chapter, very much like our research lodge, um, it's they meet four times a year, same as us. Their regular meeting is March 20th, so I will be there as a speaker. So we will not be having this meeting, but I will have a link to their Zoom as soon as they have it. So it'll be out on the group for you all to attend. So that's going to be two Saturdays from now. We're not meeting next week. We're not meeting the following week, but I would hope as many of you as possible will join me and join Virginia Research Chapter, and you can hear me talk. Uh, I do have to say that is an actual stated meeting for the research chapter. You must be a Royal Arch Mason to attend. And for our British brothers, we will, I, I don't know, there may be those of you who are Mark masters who are not, Mark, yeah, Mark Masons who are not Royal Arch. I don't know if that's the case. That's about I think that would be okay. Um, I, but I don't own, I do not control that chapter. I'm not, a, I'm a member, but I'm not an officer or anything. I'm just a guest, but they've allowed me to promote it. And so I'm doing this to bring some brothers along with me. I think that'll be a lot of fun, but it is an actual meeting. So you must be at least a, you must be a Royal Arch Mason. Uh, so just regular master Masons are not going to be allowed to attend that. I'm sorry. And they don't put their stuff online either. They don't put it on YouTube or anything. 
when they're done. But that should be a lot of fun. So that's Saturday the 20th. And all of this is on the group, but I'm, on the group page, but I'm going to say it in case people, they seem to miss what I post in the group. So Sunday the 21st, because we are not having a regular Zoom meeting on Saturday, that's when I decided to host br uh, Brother Justin Sledge, who is an Orthodox Jew who will be speaking on Jewish alchemists. He's not able to attend a Zoom meeting on the Sabbath, which is Saturday, of course. And I didn't want to record him because I want people to have the opportunity to ask questions. So we're going to have a special Zoom meeting on Sunday, the 21st at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And that should be a lot of fun. And we already had a previous speaker about alchemy um, in January, I think it was. So this has been kind of cool to have another talk about that and get into some of these things. Um, so any questions about the schedule and that I just outlined? April 10? April 10, you're coming up. Yes, that's going to be you. Well, I'm not going to hear hear. Yeah, time. you can hear me? I can hear you now, yes. Eureka! Yes, and... <laughs> I'm not, I'm not listing the whole schedule. I'm just giving a couple weeks out. But yes, Brother Carson Perfect. was ready to speak. It's my fault, not his, that he's not there. I'm, Brother Brian offered to give me another speaker. I said, no, no, it's, it's not him. It's me. I won't be here. <laughs> We're not having any meeting. But yeah, I, I just want to give the next two weeks because it's uh, a little bit different what we're doing. But yeah, every week I'll be announcing the next week or two if I, as I line them up. I think I'll just get in the habit of that is giving them the next two weeks so people know who the upcoming speakers are. But just for those of you who are new, um, what we do here is some weeks we have a speaker, like Brother Gomez is going to be our guest speaker today. And that's what's normal for a, a Masonic Zoom meeting. It's just like a lodge meeting where you have a speaker and they speak about their topic and then you have discussion, question and answers. What we like to do here, are I try to do different things, change it up. Some weeks we have a panel discussion where I interview several people. And some weeks we have uh, a free-for-all, what I call them, Sonic Mania, where basically I'm going to ask questions of every single person attending the meeting. So everyone gets a chance to participate and talk about what masonry is going on, asking questions about their lodge and how they do things and stuff. So it's a lot of fun. So I try to keep things different here. If you have any suggestions about what you want us to do at this meeting, if you have any ideas for a speaker, if you'd like to speak, if you want a specific topic, anything, please message me or email me. Uh, I'm on Facebook all the time, so it's easier to get to me through Facebook Messenger than email. But if you're not, then email's fine. Um, but uh, I really, I'm open to any kind of suggestions on how I can make these more interesting for everybody. I don't want this to be, you know, I don't want this to be routine. We show up, we talk for two seconds, we go to the speaker, we close. I mean, I want it to be interesting and lively because we're online and we can do pretty much anything we want to do. So that's why I'm trying to uh, have a little variety. Uh, anybody else got anything to bring up before I introduce our speaker? Okay. All right. Well, good to see everybody here. Um, I'm going to make sure everybody's muted. I'm going to introduce Brother uh, Brother Gomez. Oh, Brother Knox is coming in. Let's go and bring him in, and then we'll get ready to start. Hello, Brother Knox. Welcome. We're getting ready to start here. Good to have you. Brother Gomez, are you ready? Yes, sir, my brother. Whenever you're ready, just let me know. Yes. I'll be here. All right. I'm going to introduce him. I will let you give your own titles and such because I, I don't want to butcher names and titles and such. So, Brother Gomez, please introduce yourself and you have the floor. All right, my brother, let me just quickly share my presentation and I'll begin. Uh, can you see it? Can you see the slides? Yes, I can. Okay, that's good. Just to make sure. All right. Good morning and good afternoon, uh, depending what part of the globe you're you're coming from. Uh, my name is Right Worshipful Moses Gomez. I'm the current Grand Historian of the Grand Lodge of New Jersey. 
uh, from a little lodge, uh, Atlas Pythagoras Lodge number 10 here in Westfield, New Jersey. I do travel all over the world and I've been to the UK and Scotland and many other parts of the world uh, presenting lectures uh, and speaking all over the country. But uh, today I'm going to be speaking about something that's very close to my heart, uh, revolutions and masonry and, and whatnot in Cuba, because my parents were born and raised in Cuba. I was born here in the United States, but uh, they were actually uh, came to the United States a few years before Castro. But, and Cuba is very interesting when it comes to the history of Cuba concerning masonry. Now, Cuba is no stranger to, uh, to a lot of history in the Caribbean. It's one of the, it's the 16th largest island in the world. Uh, it's roughly about 860 miles long. And at, at its narrowest point, it's about 50 miles to 120 miles at its widest. Uh, and Cuba, of course, was discovered by Christopher Columbus, or at least he's the first European to discover because Cuba was already there. Uh, but Cuba became a very important hub uh, for Spain uh, in many ways. It, Cuba became... Uh, the viceroy, the, the governorship of the outside of, of, of Spain, uh, that person had probably as much power as, as the uh, king and queen of Spain. Cuba was important because it was a centralized hub as the Spaniards were conquering and, and expanding their territories in the Caribbean and South America, central, southern parts of the United States. Of course, they were bringing back all kind of wonderful new products. Uh, like corn and potato and chocolate and coffee and sugar, and, uh, which are wonderful treats, and of course, uh, gold, which was the most sought after material. Uh, the top map displays one of the oldest known maps that they've written, uh, created uh, for Cuba. And the bottom one is one of the earliest known maps with the new Cuban flag, which we'll get into it later. Now, Cuba's had masonry for quite some time, since the early uh, 1800s, but the first uh, masons to arrive uh, were actually the British. And we, at least we know that we don't know if any of the Spaniards were Masons, which I'm sure they might have been. Uh, we just don't have any records of that. But uh, Cuba was part of the Spanish Dominion for probably close to 400 years. Uh, and around 1762, the British Empire uh, took over a few of the islands in the Caribbean, including Cuba, away from Spain. Uh, it wasn't for long. It was less than a year. They signed the treaty and they returned all the islands back. Uh, but while they were in that treaty, uh, they actually, an Irish regiment had a charter. Uh, which was actually granted before uh, they actually traveled abroad, which was Lodge number 218, which is still on the register of the Grand Lodge of Ireland. Uh, and I actually contacted some friends of mine in the Grand Lodge office, and they verified and sent me some information on it. Uh, but again, these brethren uh, were able to hold communication, but not make any masons, or they didn't make any while they were in Cuba, at least at the time. Uh, the bottom paragraph kind of speaks a little bit about uh, whether... It was a writing that's, that's the only known writing we have from that lodge at that time period. Uh, and of course, it was done in Havana in the year of the Lord, 1763, signed by the master, wardens, and secretary of the lodge. And this is the first time we know of, or the earliest time that we know that masonry arrived on the island or was working on the island, not as a lodge chartered on the island, but just a traveling lodge as these military lodges were traveling around, around the world. Now, the first official charter of a lodge that was granted in Cuba uh, was the lodge of the, Theolo the Temple of Theological Virtues, which was in 1804. Oddly enough, it was chartered by the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania here, which has chartered many, many lodges outside of its borders as well. Now, the interesting thing is that the first worship master of this was Joseph Cernu, uh, the great Frenchman who was involved with the Scottish Rite. Uh, of course, he has many, uh, uh, there's many stories about him. He tried to create his own schism here in the United States, but he was heavily involved with Scottish Rite, bringing it from, Scot uh, from France into the Caribbean uh, and then into the United States. Uh, but again, that was, there were other many lodges that were chartered by many other jurisdictions, including Louisiana, South Carolina, and the Grand Orient of France during those early years. Now, the interesting thing about Joseph Cernu is that, uh, of course, he was a Frenchman. He goes to live in Havana, which I never knew. Uh, I mean, he played a, a real political figure in the Scottish Rite. Uh, I mean, he, there was some schisms that he was trying to do, but nevertheless, he, he was doing degrees. He was selling degrees. Uh, he was trying to create his own jurisdiction after the uh, formation of the uh, Supreme, first Supreme Council of the World here in, in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, but little to my uh, knowing that he had actually uh, fled to Cuba, and there he orchestrated a, a, the chartering of a new lodge, with, which has connection of Pennsylvania, which I'm still trying to determine why he went so far to Pennsylvania to get one. Uh, 
and that is on Mother Comfrey of France, even though he was a little bit in the in turmoil with them. Uh, but nevertheless, the Lodge Charters goes on to have significant importance within the island of Cuba itself. Now, the original charter is still there. It's on display at the Grand Lodge Museum and Library in the Grand Lodge Building in Havana, Cuba. It is still in pretty good condition. It's definitely uh, a wonderful treat for me to actually get to go see what I went there two years ago. Now, Cuba is no stranger to independence, persecution, and oppression. And for some unaccountable reason, Freemasonry appears to have always been under persecution. A lot of it had to do because of the fact that Spain was a almost 100% Catholic country. And of course, Catholics were forbidden from joining, as many other religions do. Uh, this was a part of one of the reasons that there was a lot of hostilities between it, because of course, many kings and queens and potentates and dictators around, the, especially during Europe, have always persecuted uh, masonry because masonry uh, always posed a, a, a threat, especially when it came to free thinkers uh, in our time, and they didn't like that. The other threat we had was the threat of oppression and the threat of dictatorial or monarchical rule, which was the case in Cuba. Now, Cuba had many different uh, independences and, and, and times where they actually tried to fight for their freedoms. Uh, early 1800s, they had some of the 1860s, the 1870s, they had another ones in 1898, which drew in the, American, uh, the Americans into the Spanish-American War as well. Uh, but the first of interest is the Great Masonic Conspiracy. The unique thing about Cuba, and I, you know, we can say this about many revolutions, for, for most of the revolutions, the modern revolutions of our time, beginning with the American Revolution, have been led by Freemasons. But it's, uh, it would be mistaken to say that Freemasonry was behind these revolutions. It was just many Freemasons who were involved in these revolutions, I guess following the principles and, and, and ideals of, of, of a free Masonic uh, lodge and Freemasonic men, that kind of inspired them to, to lead some of these revolutions. However, in Cuba was a little different. Cuba was the largest and Freemasonry was directly involved and was behind all the conspiracies, including the first one in 1810, when Manuel de Céspedes actually to try to, and William Infante tried to begin the first break from Spain in 1810. Now, the reason they call the Great Masonic Conspiracy is because all the, the takers and, and participants in this engagement were Masons. And this was discussed in Masonic Lodge or in Tal Masonic Lodge because of the secrecy and because they were able to protect what was going on there and on a Mason's word that it would not get, hopefully not spread out or nobody would leak the, the information. So there's no doubt about it. There's proof that Mason, these, these Masonic uh, independence and revolutions did organize and start in Masonic Lodges. Now, the, the good thing is that Infante was the leader of the first one. He was also a member of that lodge in 18, 1810 that was created in 1804. And he becomes friends with Tristan Leovature, he becomes friends with Simon Boulevard, Francisco de Miranda. He becomes friends with many other Masonic revolutions, each in their own part of the world, whether it's Venezuela, South America, Haiti, uh, which gives them an opportunity to kind of inspire them to have one here. Many Freemasons were involved here in America. Uh, later on after American, it inspired Haiti. After the Haitian, it inspired the revolutions in 1806 in Venezuela and then in South America. So this was just a, a stepping stone for uh, Infante to want to begin a revolution here. The unique thing is that the first constitution written for a free independent Cuba was drafted during the, that short insurrection of 1810. And about 80 something years later, when they had the final revolution, which broke uh, the dominion and, and independence of Spain, given that Cuba's independence, they actually used those constitutions that were created almost a century ago uh, in 1810. Now, some of the conspirators in this, in this coup tried to have a full, complete revolution. And by that, I mean is that here in the Americas, in the United States here, when we had a revolution, uh, we did break from monarchical rule. However, we didn't have a full, complete revolution as to where we were still having the issues of, of keeping humans in bondage or enslaved. Uh, the first slave rebellion in the world happened in Haiti, uh, and their revolution was twofold. It was aimed at ridding themselves of an imperial monarchical rule, but also freeing themselves from the boot of slavery. So they were actually a pretty full, complete revolution. And many of the ones subsequent after that, in particular the one here in Cuba that they tried, was to also have that full, complete 
a revolution by getting rid of themselves of slavery. And they also conspired with Jose Antonio Aponte, who tried to recruit many Creoles and slaves in the island to help them fight on this first cause and first fight for independence. Of course, it was short-lived. Uh, the insurrection was put down quickly. And in 1812, many of these leaders uh, were arrested. They were tried. They were convicted. Many were sent to prison. Many were sent to, uh, back into slavery. And many were, were killed or, were, or you know, they were either hung or shot on the firing squad, including Jose Amponte, who was beheaded. His head was placed in an iron cage and hung from a street pole uh, in a particular corner in Havana, Cuba. Now, it is said that the Grand Lodge building was purposely built on the location where this brother was beheaded, trying to lead the first, indeed, independence for Cuba and slave and freeing of the slaves as well. So that's the, uh, when you go see the Grand Lodge building, you will see a plaque that says on this particular spot stood uh, the head of um, Jose Antonio Ponte, who lost his life in the defense of liberty and freedom. Now, many can be said that many revolutions around the world, many of these famous leaders who led them, whether it was Garibaldi, Kachuth, uh, again, Benito Juarez, uh, Washington, uh, yeah, many were Freemasons. Uh, but in Cuba, we, it seems like they were all Freemasons. There's very, you know, I've been trying to find those who weren't. Uh, and all these individuals you hear, see here span about 100 years, depending on whatever time they were, they were actually leading a, a fight. And they were all Freemasons, all participating and engaging in creating some sort of new independent Cuba. In particular, with the photo up in the left-hand corner, which shows a group of Masons, I believe, what looks like outside of their lodge or building, uh, just have, having a meeting on, on, in their lodge, and they were all, again, freedom fighters for this cause. Well, during that first revolution, Jose Francisco Limas and Jose Maria Hereda were involved in Ramon de la Luz, who was a first Masonic member of the Lodge in Cuba when it was granted by the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. Many of these individuals played a part in that uh, Lodge itself, and they were all part of the conspirators trying to gather men and ammunition and fighting for the cause of that independence of Cuba. Now, what they did do is they did create a Masonic appendage body, kind of like an affiliate body, which was known Reyes de los Soles de Boulevard. Rays of the Sun of Boulevard, in honor of Simon Bolivar, another Freemason, the liberator of South America. Uh, and here, these individuals had signs, they had rituals, they had hierarchies of Freemasonry, uh, but they also had to bring in, in, in a set amount of individuals and members into their order. Each affiliate soul that was named of a, of a new affiliate of, of the Lodge, before becoming enlightened or a full member, had to recruit no less than seven followers with whom they maintained links and actually had vouched for them as well into this order. Now, again, they had Masonic overtones when they created their flag, uh, but what is in this indisputable fact and which may have more to do with this tolerance is that the very independence of Cuba was achieved with the assistance of Cuban Freemasons. Now, the current Lodge of Cuba, the Grand Lodge of Cuba, was founded on December 5th, 1859, it was titled the Grand Lodge of Colón, under the name, honoring the name of Columbus, to conceal the Masonic practices established on the island. Again, they were still on the hostilities. The Spain, the Spanish kind of realized uh, that many of their officers were Masons, and in order to avoid the hostilities and coups and, and, and a possible uh, overthrow of the government or, or the king and queen of Spain, they felt it quiet that if, as long as they don't know about it, it doesn't matter to them. Of course, they didn't publicly advocate you become a Mason because it was against the Catholic faith. But again, they realized that they didn't want to stir upheaval and resentment to where these individuals are now turned against them. So they kind of turned a blind eye on it. In Cuba, they did the same thing. They kind of disguised it so that they wouldn't be persecuted. But they all knew very well that Masonry was, was beginning a very strong Cuba. Now, on December 27th, they chartered their first three lodges, Fraternidad Número Uno, Prudencia number two, Isan Andres number three. Today, after speaking with the Grand Master, who's, uh, who I know very well uh, a couple of weeks ago, he advised me that there are 322 Masonic lodges in Cuba with little over 25,000 members. Uh, and that is not bad considering that they are still a communist country and working under that regime. 
There are 16 provinces, each with a district deputy or a provincial grand master in some districts. Uh, and there's about 100 districts within those provinces. Most lodges in Cuba work under the Scotch Rite, but there are four lodges which use the York Rite, or similar to the American Rite. And currently in Havana, there are 116 lodges operating fully in Havana. Now, the interesting thing about Freemasonry in Cuba is that they meet every single week of the year, with the exception of the week in May, which they celebrate their independence, and the week of Christmas or the holiday week in December. Other than that, they meet 50 times a year. And their meetings are structured differently. They have four set meetings every month. One meeting is for degrees, one is to do business, one is for programs and education like this today, and one is for benevolence. Of course, if they have candidates and an extra amount of candidates, they try to space them out. They really don't try to do or rush their candidates and they don't believe in these one day classes and where you're raised and, and, and get everything in one day. Uh, they really take their time with becoming Masons, as in most other parts of outside the United States. Uh, but again, it's broken down into a weekly event and it's prescribed and scheduled every week. They do a particular item in the lodge so that they can have more time uh, for themselves and fellowship instead of trying to cram everything into one night. Now, this was the original charter that was granted uh, the, to the Grand Lodge of Cologne. Uh, it is in quite disrepair. It is in, in pretty bad shape, but it is still on display. This one I could not touch or hold because it's really, really fragile. It's completely dry rotted, uh, but it's still on display in the Grand Lodge of Cuba. Now, the Grand Lodge of Cuba does have uh, what they consider their Masonic appendant bodies, <clears throat> which are operating under, under the umbrella of masonry. However, they don't have the normal appendant bodies that we would have else around the world. They do have the Daughters of Acacia, which is very similar to the Order of the Eastern Star created here in the United States and well known throughout the world. Uh, the ladies dress in white, they have age restriction, uh, and they pretty much function with the same kind of rules and regulations as the Eastern Star there to assist the brethren as well as we do here, or the ladies do here with us. At one point, uh, around in the 1950s, they started expanding into Central America, actually opening up these lodges in Costa Rica, in Panama, in El Salvador, in Guatemala. And today there are 16 lodges that exist in Cuba, and keeping in mind that they are growing uh, by leaps and bounds, and they're slowly beginning to, to restore, uh, not that they were able completely gone, but Cuba, not that they're free, but uh, they're a little bit lax and a little bit more open now, and they're actually definitely much more open to the public when in terms of Freemasonry. So they are growing quite a bit. The Association of Veterans Masons of Cuba is not what you might think. It has nothing to do with being a veteran of a, of a war or a veteran of a military order. Uh, it is a specific group, an offset, uh, an offshoot of the Masonic Craft Lodge, and this organization gives. Masons, Master Masons, who have given 20 years or more of dedicated service to the craft, the honor of being a member of the veteran of the Masons of Cuba. Uh, and this is very prestigious. This is very, very unique with them. They have a, this is incredible honor to receive, to be a member. So when they're considered a veteran, it means you're a veteran Mason of, um, of the Grand Lodge of Cuba. And just to give you an idea, when the Grand Lodge of Cuba has their annual sessions, there are only two brothers that are received as standing with a with a standing ovation, and that is the sovereign grand commander of the Scottish Rite and the dean of the Meritorious Association of the Veterans of Masons. That gives you an idea how important they are and how prestigious and, and sought after that this group is with the accolades they receive. There is a small group, as the Grand Master called it, because we really don't have a name for it. We are calling them the Youngings, uh, and it's similar to the Order of Demolay. For youth organizations here, uh, for those across the, the pond, we do have groups, youth organizations, Rainbow Girls and Demolay for Young Boys, which are sponsored and under the auspices of the Masonic umbrella, even though they're their own independent order. And again, they're trying to eventually, hopefully, bring in these orders into Cuba. Uh, but this organization is geared towards uh, developing young men at an early age, with, of course, the idea of hopefully they becoming members of the craft later on, as is here in America with Demolay. The Masons in Cuba do have a Masonic home, uh, but it's a little different than what we normally consider uh, here in the United States, where uh, here, like here in New Jersey, we do have a Masonic home that was built in 1898 to assist the uh, Masons, widows, and orphans 
of Masons. In Cuba, when it was begun in 1886, uh, it was actually named for beggars and those who, the poor sinners and those who were poor and destitute. And it was really aimed at helping the homeless uh, with shelter and clothing and food and provide spiritual and medical assistance. So they actually built these Masonic contests to help the community and those non-Masons. Of course, Masons were helped indeed as well, but they were gearing more to those individuals, the poor and distressed individuals that were out on the street who needed help. The, the other side to this is that, for instance, here in New Jersey, our Masonic home, if you're a brother, not so much now, but in, the, in years past, if you're a brother who needed a place to live, uh, maybe you got you retired, you didn't have enough funds, you can live there for the rest of your life, no worries. Here with this situation here in Cuba, they don't do that all the time. They, when you come in, we bring you in, we feed you, we shelter you, we care for you, we give you medical attention, we get you up on your feet, we may find a job, but the goal, ultimate goal is to get you out, to get you in better shape than you were when you came in and eventually set you on your path so you can continue a life of service and a life of work with your family. Now, they do have little casitas, which are called cottages, uh, which can house two to three persons. So if you have a family, if you're destitute or you're indigent and you have a wife and a child, you can actually come into a casita and they give you a private little residence so you can have some semblance of a home life there. But again, it's to, it's to lift your spirits, get you up off your feet, and get you back into society and back into the community. Uh, for a short time during the revolution, they did have to close it because lack of funds, the facilities were lacking repairs, they needed, they were in great disrepair, uh, but they have since opened, they have put a lot of money into it, and slowly it is beginning to open 100%. Uh, right now they have about 100 elderly individuals in there uh, working with it, but again, uh, the issue with Cuba is they don't have a lot of money, they don't have a lot of resources, uh, so it takes a lot of effort to help. So everybody pitches in and whatever they can. You have masons that pitch in with masons. You have carpenters. You have plumbers. And everybody pitches in their best to, to try to build and rebuild and, and bring the, this compound and this Masonic home back to a semblance of what it was before. But they are doing a wonderful job with it. Now, they do have, like we have here with this Virginia Laws of Research, they do have an Academy of Higher Masonic Studies. Uh, and this was created for the purpose of providing educational programs to the brethren. Now, of course, this was uh, created back uh, quite some time in the 1930s, uh, and it's still very prevalent to this day. Uh, this is probably one of their greatest uh, accomplishments and most, most respected group there, as they really use this to continue education, especially remembering that one meeting out of the, every month, one week out of every month is designed for Masonic programs and education. So this weighs heavy in there, and they're trying to spread this throughout the whole island nation uh, so that they can have, every lodge can have this type of Masonic higher education. Now, the Grand Lodge building in Cuba was built uh, around the, the Art Deco years, or about around the 30s in Cuba. And it's a magnificent building. It's 11 stories. At one point, it was, it was the highest building in Havana, Cuba, outside of the cathedral. Uh, and again, it was a, a, a show of, 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 of their incredible talents and a magnificent building, really, really done very well. In 1955, after they created the National Masonic Museum, which was a long-awaited endeavor that they tried to create. And like every Masonic jurisdiction loves to have their own museum and library to show off their many uh, accoutrements and, and displays and many artifacts. Uh, and here in this particular library, which I had the pleasure of uh, browsing quite a bit, uh, they have many wonderful artifacts and many belonging to other parts of the world, and including a lot of American artifacts here as well. Uh, the building, of course, because it was a communist country and when Castro took over in 59, uh, no one can own property. Everything became property of the state. And of course, that being said, properties that were turned over to the state, uh, those buildings in particular, like the Grand Lodge building, which was 11 stories, six of those floors had to be used for government purposes. So the government of Cuba, the communist country, took over those floors and they used it for their own purposes. Of course, they didn't provide any funds. They didn't give any money. They couldn't rent out the rooms. They couldn't rent out the building to provide income. So it, it fell in disrepair over the years. Uh, and they, the brethren did their best to keep as, to upkeep the building and maintain it best they can. Uh, there are two floors, the ground floor and the first floor is theirs. And then there's several upper floors, including the last floor, which is, belongs to the Grand Lodge there today, including the Museum Library. Uh, and again, it is open a few hours a day, a couple of days a week, depending if the brothers, if they can get some brothers to be there and host and open 
and become uh, docents providing tours. So it's done on a voluntary purpose, uh, completely all voluntary. Uh, and again, these brethren do dedicate themselves quite a bit. And if you are visiting Havana and you'd like to visit me, I do recommend calling ahead of time or making arrangements ahead of time because then they will make sure that someone is there to give you a proper tour and explanation of all the artifacts. It's a huge, it's a really large museum. It's all on one floor and they have an incredible lot of history there dating back from the early Spanish colonial days to the present day now. Now, Cuba was no stranger to Masonic appendant bodies. They did have Royal Arch. They did have Knights Templars. Uh, they did have Eastern Star. Uh, they still have the, the Scottish Rite. The only two working Masonic groups in Cuba is the Craft Lodge and the Scottish Rite. The Scottish Rite has been there for quite some time. Uh, it is one of the oldest uh, Supreme Councils in the world. Uh, and they have been working and prospering ever since. They, they have not uh, ceased. And they are doing very well and is a very predominant and well-respected organization in Cuba there. Uh, of course, they are trying to bring these appendant bodies back. They are working now. And as I, last time I spoke, they were trying to bring Royal Arch to the, uh, the uh, International Royal Arch to bring them uh, into Cuba and eventually start up again as, as they had before. Now the Cuban, Masonic, the Cuban Masonic flag, and I say that because it has a lot of Masonic overtones and it was actually designed by Narcisio Lopez. Uh, but the unique thing is that Narcisio Lopez designed the flag here in New York City. Uh, now, during many periods in Cuba from the early 1800s to the Spanish-American War, Cubans and Americans had a big interest in each other. The United States had a particular interest in Cuba since the early years of President Thomas Jefferson. And just about every president since and administration since has had a particular keen interest in Cuba. And many of the presidents sought to propose legislation to annex Cuba from Spain, not by military force, but actually buy it. Like they bought Alaska from Russia and, 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 and the parts of the United States from France. They always tried to offer money to Spain to buy it off them, but it never came to fruition. Uh, but the United States has always had a lot of uh, incredible love affair with Cuba. Uh, Cuba, Cubans did help during the Revolutionary War. Uh, they helped us in the South, in particular in Florida and some of the uh, uh, cities in Florida, like St. Augustine is one of the oldest cities in America. Uh, they did help. And some of these freedom fighters that actually helped us here in, in the in War of Revolution actually were the ones that went on to conspire in that first Masonic uh, conspired fight for uh, independence back in the early 1800s. Now, the Cuban flag, which I never knew, being a Mason for 13 years and being descendants of Cubans, never knew that the Cuban flag, when turned upright, is and resembles a Masonic apron. And if you look at it, it does have the Masonic triangle. It has the, the, the blue and white stripes of a blue lodge and craft lodge. Uh, but the Cuban flag was definitely inspired and designed with Masonic overtones by a Freemason, Narcisio Lopez. However, he created it while he was in exile here in New York City. Uh, and the it was actually flown for the first time on May 11th, 1850, by Moses Y. Beach, no relations to me, who was the publisher of the Sun newspaper in Lower Manhattan. And the newspaper actually writes an article calling the attention of its readers to this strange flag that's flying over their building. High above is the flag of free Cuba. There is the flag which sooner or later will float over the Morro. The Morro being the Morro Castle, which was at the point defending the entrance to the port of Havana was built by the Spaniards about 300 years ago. Eight days later, on May 19, 1850, it flew for the first time over Cuban over soil when Brother Narcisio Lopez carried it as a battle flag when he landed in Cardenas, Cuba, for the beginning of the Second War of Independence in, 18, in, uh, in, in the 1850s. The most eloquent testimony of Freemasons' historical significance for Cuba is to be found in the loftiest symbol, the Cuban flag, where the Masonic ideal is correctly expressed in the red Masonic triangle placed over the three blue and two white bands, a symbol that sealed the intimate connection between Cuba independence and Freemasonry for eternity. Now the Cuban flag went also on to inspire many other flags around the world who were at the time also trying to lead their own revolutions, like in Puerto Rico, in the Philippines, and the 
Catalan separatists who were trying to free themselves and to this day still consider them a separate part. And this is a part of Spain, which encompasses the city of Alicante and Barcelona. That portion of Spain uh, for over a century or more, almost two centuries, have been trying to fight for their independence. Not so much now, uh, but at mo one point they did have the Catalan, Catalan separatists trying to free themselves and create their own independent nation from Spain. Each of these leaders who led these revolutions were also Freemasons and also corresponded with many of the Cuban leaders here, uh, in, in particular Puerto Rico, uh, where Batances, the brother who led revolutions there, was a close friend of the Cuban patriots and actually conspired together and assisted each other in these quests for their independences. Now, in the Spanish-American War in 1898, uh, the United States uh, took over Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the Philippines. Puerto Rico is still a territory of the United States. Philippines was eventually given its independence. Uh, and Cuba was given its independence early on in 1902, right on the outset from that. But we did still have control over Puerto Rico. Now, the Cuban National Anthem was created by Pedro Felipe Figueredo, uh, who was uh, uh, also a freedom fighter in Cuba. He was a poet, a musician, a uh, freedom fighter in the 19th century. In the 1860s, he was very active in the planning of the Cuban uprising against the Spanish, known as the Ten Years' War, which started October 10th, 1868. He is well known for writing the Cuban National Anthem, El Himno de Bayamón, in 1867. He was captured during the war and executed on the 17th of August, 1870. His daughter, Candelaria Figueroa, became a hero of the uprising by carrying the new independent Cuban flag into the Battle of Bayamón in 1868. Now, the interesting thing I'm interested about this individual, that he was also, like I said, a Freemason and a very integral part of that first, of that second war of independence in 1868. Uh, the, the issue, the, the big issue was that uh, here in the, in, in the grand jurisdiction of New Jersey, during this same time period, we had many immigrants from around the world, in particular, a lot of immigrants from Puerto Rico and Spain. So being that we had a lot of Spanish speaking, German speaking, Italian speaking, French speaking uh, uh, brethren here in New Jersey, the Grand Lodge of New Jersey did allow charters to certain new char uh, lodges so that the brethren can operate and speak and have fellowship and tile lodges in their own respective language, providing they communicated with the Grand Secretary in English, uh, in particular the minutes, they can do an open business, they can open do degrees, all in their native tongue where they came from. Of course, over the years, as those individuals died off and their sons and grandsons uh, became older, became Masons, they adopted more American lifestyle, they, they spoke English, so that particular language and speaking that language lines kind of died out. Well, in 2018, we elected our first Hispanic, Cuban Hispanic Grand Master here for the first time in the Grand Lodge of New Jersey. We've never had a Hispanic Grand Master. He was actually born and raised in Cuba. And we did have some clandestine Spanish, Portuguese, and Italian-speaking uh, lodges that were working here. Many of the Cuban ones were Cuban, and they were exiles uh, from Cuba who couldn't fit in because they didn't know the language well, and they just continued that. Masonic tradition of, of meeting as Masons in their own private little world uh, and, and trying to get them involved, our Grand Master decided that, listen, if you join us, become members of the Grand Lodge of New Jersey, I'll, I'll grant you charters, which are same names, and I'll allow you to do the work in your respective tongue. As, as the members progress, if they want to do it in English, that's fine, but you can continue working under your own tongue. So in 2018, he chartered five new lodges, four Spanish, one Portuguese, and they're working on an Italian one now. Uh, but the one that one that they did name was Perucho Figueredo in honor of this individual, Pedro Figueredo, who was the individual who created the Cuban National Anthem. So now we have a Spanish-speaking lodge in New Jersey here named after this individual. Now, again, before I said the United States had an incredible love affair with Cuba, a uh, kind of love-hate love affair. Theodore Roosevelt uh, fought in, in the Battle of the Spanish-American War, uh, fighting in old San Juan Hill in, in, with the Rough Riders in Cuba. Uh, all, Orville H. Platt created the Platt Amendment, which is a well-known amendment in, here in the United States. Uh, William H. Taft and McKinley were presidents, but they were also Masonic presidents. They also had a particular hand uh, here 
in, in the dealings with Cuba. Now, Oliver Platt, Platt decides to put forth the Platt Amendment. Uh, and this was a aimed at trying to not annex the island of Cuba, but eventually give it its own independence. And he felt that we should not annex and control it, but to actually support it, defend it, and give it its proper due. Now, from these amendments came the reason why the United States was a protectorate of Cuba, as we were of Japan after World War II. When Japan signed a new constitution after the uh, surrender on board the, in, 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 in Pearl Harbor, they asked General MacArthur that they would not have a military army or presence ever again, so that this would, these atrocities would never occur again, either to foreigners or to have them done on their own people, that they prefer not to have a military. So we kind of, Americans kind of became the protectors or the godfathers to say, and I'm using an analogy word here, uh, as, as the protector of Japan, as we did for Cuba. If anybody were to attack Cuba at that, in those years, uh, it, was an, it was a declaration of war against the United States, and we had every right to defend Cuba at all costs. It is also why we had Guantanamo Bay, which is very famous because we have many uh, uh, in, outside Islamic terrorists who have been uh, in prison there. Uh, and it's been very famous because during all of the years of Castro's revolution, there was an American Marine and Naval base presence there and an extremely large military base there at the eastern end of Cuba. Of Cuba. And this was something that was a thorn of him because he could not get rid of it. On the, on the treaties and the laws that we signed before by his predecessors, uh, if he tried to engage or take that uh, part of the island by, by force or insurrection, it would mean that we would have to go to war with Cuba, and that was a war he did not want. Uh, Castro was a very intelligent individual, uh, but he knew how far to draw the line. Uh, and that's one of the issues that I always had with Cuba, like I had with North Korea. They, Castro and, and mm -hmm. like North Korea, they are a little bit wild, they're a little bit crazy, but they know how far to throw that rock. They're going to throw that pebble oh. just so far. And the issue is that Castro hated America, he talked bad about America, but he never once threw a pebble in our backyard because he knew that he himself could never withstand the American forces and didn't want to incur their wrath. Now, Henry M. Teller introduced the Teller Amendment. And the Teller Amendment was an amendment to a joint resolution of the United States Congress enacted in 1898 to reply to William McKinley's war message. It placed a condition on the United States military presence in Cuba. According to the clause, the United States could not annex Cuba, but only leave control of the island to its people. In short, the, US helps, the United States would help Cuba gain its independence and withdraw all its troops from the country. Now, Henry Teller was the sovereign grand inspector general or the head of his, uh, the Scottish Rite in his state of Colorado. He was also a grand master on two different occasions in Colorado. And he writes this little paragraph, which I, I, I really thought uh, long enough and read and I enjoyed reading it because uh, of what it actually means and, 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 and how he pointed it. And I believe it has a lot of Masonic overtones as to not become uh, a, a tyrannical leader or not become an annexed country, but to give people their right to do in their independence. Uh, I never could do better than now when the American flag has come down from Cuba, but better still, a flag for Cuba has gone up. The American flag is the best flag in the world for Americans. It is not the best flag for men who do not want it. It is not the best flag for Cuba. Cuba's flag, not representing the hundredth part of the power and glory of ours, is the flag for Cuba. And when the Filipinos shall put up their flag, ours shall come down. And as I believe it will be someday, it will be a better flag to them than ours can be. Although you may, you may administer your government with all the kindness and all the wisdom which human beings are capable, the best flag is the flag that the men themselves put up. And it is the only flag that ought to command the admiration and love and affection of the men who live under it. And it is the only flag that will. Liberty-loving men will never have any love for a flag that they did not create and they do not defend. And that really is a very impressive paragraph in a short, uh, in, in, in short paragraph that he actually wrote. Uh, and it really smacks of Freemasonry because it actually, to me, it actually says, uh, you know, as in a lodge, we are all equal, we are all on the level, and we must all respect each other. There is no governing body. There is no 
Uh, you know, we, we don't have control over our, our brethren. And jurisdictions worldwide have their own independence as well. And that's what really is the beauty of Freemasonry. And I believe that, uh, that his feelings of how he lived as a Freemason uh, were conveyed into this message here. Now, William McKinley, I always tell a little story about William McKinley because I believe that Masonry could be very influential. Uh, it's very important to, to understand that. Uh, McKinley was not a president, uh, but he was a, a uh, officer during the Civil War. And he had actually caught many Civil War prisoners and had built a prison, a prisoner camp for them. Many were injured, many were sick. So on one day he decided that he was going to visit the camp, but he was going to bring his own personal doctor of the regiment there to assist in any way he can. While there, the he's walking around with the doctor, he noticed that the doctor from now, from time and again, would reach down, shake a particular person's hand, prisoner's hand, he would cover his hand, whisper in his ear, sometimes give them money, and it felt like he knew this individual. Knowing he was from Ohio, he was from a northern free state, never had, had, had lived in a southern state, he, he, he would wonder why this doctor seemed like he knew these individuals. So after they returned back to their camp, he asked the doctor, he said, I noticed you, it seemed like you knew some of these individuals. He said, well, I didn't know them, but they weren't strangers. And it was a little odd to, to uh, McKinley. And he asked him, he goes, well, I also noticed that you whispered in the ear, you gave them money. Uh, he goes, do you ever expect to give it back, uh, get it back from them? And he said, well, uh, if they can pay it back, they will. If not, it was my Masonic duty to give them whatever I could within the length of my cable tone. Uh, and it struck McKinley odd because the doctor was telling him uh, that although he did not know these individuals, they were brethren of a craft of masonry. And besides that we were on against each other on different sides of the, of the war, different sides of the line, it didn't matter. At this particular moment, this brother asked for my assistance, gave me a sign of distress, and it is incumbent upon every Mason to help another Mason in distress to the length of his cable toe. Uh, and, he, and as he said, he goes, if they can pay it back, they will. If they can't, I did my best within my own limits. And that's what we're here to do. Now, McKinley was so impressed by this. Not the fact that, okay, you give money. I mean, I can give money to a homeless or a beggar. I'm, I'm, of course, I'm not going to expect it back, but I've done my good deed. But what, what really got him is how enemies, two men from opposing sides, enemies against each other, can have this kind of bond and relationship, even though they're literally trying to kill themselves in the battlefield. This really intrigued him. And it, 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 it really, it, 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 it led him to actually become a Freemason. He asked the doctor, uh, if this is what Freemasonry is, I'll take a slice of it for myself. And he went on to become a free Mason. He went on to become one of the most ardent pres presidential uh, Masons we've ever had. I mean, he was completely enthralled with being a Mason. Uh, he loved it. Uh, he openly public displayed it. Uh, but it, it goes to the core uh, of, of the Masonic principles that regardless who we are, where we are, that even if we don't like each other, even if we disagree with each other, even if we find ourselves in opposing sides, we're still brothers. And at the end of the day, we have this connection, this mystic tie that brings us all together. And that what was so inspiring. That was why it was so influential that it changed this guy's, this individual's personal view to say, there's got to be something there, uh, you know, especially seeing men cleave each other and butcher each other on the battlefield. And yet when the battle's over, they walk off to the side and have fellowship because there's got to be something there. Uh, and again, that's why Matrix could be such an influential tool. Now, we're going to lead up to the modern revolution that happened in 1959. And this was led by Fidel Castro, as we all might know. Uh, Castro came from a wealthy family. He was very rich, uh, a very rich land aristocrat. He was a predominant lawyer. He studied to be a lawyer. But he tried to take his first attempt at an overthrow in 1953, way before the 59 revolution, where he attacked a garrison in, in, in Cuba and tried to take it over. Of course, that was short-lived. Uh, they were all captured. The, the uh, insurrection was put down quickly. And that is named the M26-7 uh, in honor of that movement. Uh, he was sentenced to jail. He served about a year, and then he was released, and he was exiled to Mexico, where he began to formulate his plans to return and lead another revolution, which, of, of course, happened later on in 1958, when he was on a small ship named the Granma. He took off from Mexico, which is not too far from Cuba. 
and landed on the eastern shores in Sierra Madre mountain range in eastern Cuba. Uh, now, here is where we get the many stories and myths as to why Freemasonry was allowed to grow in Cuba. Now, Cuba is a particular interest to Masons because Cuba is one of the few nations where Masonry was prescribed and again, persecuted by Spanish, but it's one of the few communist socialist countries where Freemasonry continue to live, work, and thrive. I'm not gonna say they were doing uh, extremely well, but they were allowed to continue their legacy uninterrupted. Now, there are many stories as to why this happened. Now, as I said, the main story is that when Castro made his second attempt in the eastern shores of Cuba, uh, he was quickly hunted. He was quickly, his little party of insurrection was met with a hostile force, and they had to ran, run for their lives into the Sierra Mountains. And when he was in the mountains, he came across this lodge. And the Masons in that lodge gave him safe haven. They gave him shelter. They protected him until he could regroup, until the insurrection and the, and the armies sent from Cuba to quell the insurrection would kind of quiet it down. And then he can rebuild again and start again. These are one of the main stories that comes out as to why Fidel Castro left Freemasonry alone. Because at a time in his life when he was down and out and probably would have been killed, or, or, or sentenced to death, uh, if caught, uh, he was spared and he was helped by Freemasons. That is the main story that people talk about today. Uh, of course, nobody wants to openly publicly say that's actually what happened, but this is the main story that's come out of Cuba as to why Freemasonry was allowed to continue. There are many other stories. People have said that you know his family were Masons, that his close uh, mentor was a Mason, uh, the, the famous leader in the Chilean uh, uh, Salvador Allende, who was a uh, kind of similar socialist leader who was trying to uprise himself in, in Chile, also was a Freemason. Uh, some people say that Fidel and his brother Raul became Freemasons. Uh, but again, it, nothing's ever been completely uh, documented as the truth. But the main story that people believe is that the Masons gave him self, self uh, haven and protected him at his lowest point in his time when he was fleeing for his life again for the second time until he recouped. Now, there are many reasons, of course, why Freemasonry survived in Cuba, uh, but I do believe that one of the reasons that Cuba has survived, and, and, and I mean, Freemasonry in Cuba survived, uh, is, is I believe in part to the feelings and the influence that Masonry had while in Cuba. The one thing which stands out in all the history of the Cuban, of Cuban Freemasonry is the persecution which the brethren had to undergo. They've had to go through a lot of oppressions, a lot of persecution, uh, many different insurrectors, many different uh, uh, empires that tried to rule over them. But again, charges have been made that these brethren conspired against the government at many points and times throughout their history. Did not many of our American brethren conspire against the English government in the early history of our country? Do we condemn them for having so conspired? Washington, one of the chief conspirators, has become the father of, our, of the country honored and respected because he stood loyal to an ideal? Shall we condemn these early Cuban patriots for doing the same thing? To fully express what Freemasonry represents to the Cuban people, suffice it to say that without mentioning it once, twice, or perhaps a thousand times, so that one cannot write the history of the Cuban culture or Cuban struggle for freedom without the history of Freemasonry. We should honor and remember these brave men of Cuba, who inspired by their Masonic beliefs of freedom and equality for all men, never strayed them from their ideals and following in the paths of so many other revolutionary leaders and fellow Masons who fought for freedom and who carried out the Masonic ideals in doing so. Now, the interesting thing is my view on why Cuba, free, Cuban Freemason was allowed to survive. Uh, and of course, like I said, this is my own personal opinion, but I believe that Castro wasn't a dumb man. Castro was a very smooth, you know, smart intellectual. He knew that pleasing the people and keeping them on your side was the most important thing he, he can do to keep himself in power. He was a great speaker. He was a great motivator, great orator. He could speak for hours. You know, if, I mean, it was, you know, and, and it's, it's sad because some of these greatest dictators or most horrible dictators we've had, uh, including Stalin and Hitler and many others, when you look at them, they were great motivators they were great speakers they were great they, they really commanded that presence they they won the populace over uh, and, and that was something that fidel knew how to do he knew how to captivate an audience and and win them over but freemasonry in cuba 
has had a long history with the Cuban people against oppressions, against other nations, against slavery. Uh, it has always been there at the forefront, every step of the way, every independence, every revolution, every step to fight, to, to liberate the island from slavery and independence were indeed led by Masons and led by the Masonic fraternity. All of the fathers and founding fathers uh, of these revolutions and the, and the founding fathers of the nation of Cuba were indeed Freemasons. Again, there was, it was such a huge vast of Masons that were involved in this and these conspiracies and these, and these, and these coups and, and, and battles and, and, and engagements with trying to free themselves and independ themselves from, from Spain, that the people grew this love affair with this organization that was always there to pick up the challenge, to pick up the pieces, and to pick the fight to defend those who were being oppressed on the island. Regardless of what time period it was throughout the last 200 years, they've always been there. And I believe Castro realized this. Now, if you notice, in most communist and socialist countries, they remove anything significant from their past. So in Russia, they the only thing you, they remove all their, their statues and all their famous fathers, uh, anything resembling a semblance of the royal families. And all you saw was Lenin and statues of Stalin, put them statues of himself. If you go to North Korea, uh, they're, you know, the new, uh, the, the individual who's running Korea now, his father and grandfather, there's nothing beyond that. They are, they are the only ones revered. They are the fathers of that nation. Uh, so the, the past is kind of rewritten with these individuals. Castro realized that in every one of these countries, there was always turmoil. There was always inner workings and, and, and little sparks being ignited. And to avoid this, he realized that if he went against the people, that if he took their history away, if he took their patriots and founding fathers away, all of which were Freemasons, that someday those same Freemasons might rise again and conspire against him. So he must have said to himself, you know what, let me get rid of one headache that might be a problem. If I let these guys work, if I let them have their craft, if I let them work quietly and secretly, not in the public eye, I'm not going to acknowledge them publicly, but if I leave them alone, maybe they'll leave me alone. And, and ladies and brethren, uh, Castro has been one of the longest surviving living dictators until the day he died, uh, which is incredible because he is well loved. And his one curious thing is he never, ever made statues or took pride in his own image. He left the images of our founding fathers of Cuba to the people. He never took them away. Any statues of these Freemasons were left there intact. He honored them. He 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 he. he, he added them to his collective thought and his collective spirit. Uh, he talked about them, he revered them, but he never once took them away from the people. He left them their history, he left them their masonry. And that's what I believe that Castro uh, did. And I believe that's why Cuban Freemasonry, although it wasn't allowed to be public and it wasn't as strong as sometimes, but it has continued to thrive through every single year since 1959. Uh, Freemasonry, it is now wide open again. They can, they can march, they can parade, uh, they, they're out in the public again, and they are growing by leaps and bounds. And once again, they are prospering to levels they've never seen before since the revolution of 59. Uh, they don't really care anymore what they do. They leave them alone. They're, they're completely out in the open anymore. Uh, again, during Castro's year, early years, they weren't allowed to parade. They weren't allowed to be out in the public. There was no dedications. There was no uh, regalia being worn. It was all kind of done secrecy. But Castro allowed it to happen. Now, some... Cubans exiles that I've met here have said, well, Mo, the other reason is also that Castro had his spies in these lodges. I'm sure, I'm sure that was true because the first seeds of revolution or, 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 or content against his government were going to be probably in the lodges of Freemasons. So where better else to have spies than in these Masonic lodges because there is where they're going to most likely start the seeds of revolution or independence against him. So, again, he may have had his individuals there, but for the most part, he left them alone. He didn't persecute them. He didn't go after them. He didn't stop them like in other countries. Uh, all these other communist countries, it was completely shut down. Mason was not allowed to exist. Masons were persecuted. They were hunted. They were arrested. They were killed. But in Cuba, they were allowed to thrive. And to give you an idea of how powerful, influential Masons were, if anybody have seen The Godfather 2, you see that when Michael Corleone is in Cuba in 1959, New Year's Day, and 
the Cuban rebels overthrow the country of Cuba. The president uh, flees the country. Everybody's running for their lives, and they're destroying buildings and casinos, anything that had anything resembling or 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 connecting with American uh, imperialism or other countries that had interest in Cuba. They they wanted Cuba for Cubans. But interestingly enough, they left Masonic temples alone. No Masonic temple was touched. And the Masonic Grand Lines building, it was probably one of the largest buildings in Cuba at the time, was left unscathed. It was not burned. It was not looted. It was not rioted. It was left untouched, knowing that inside the building were many statues and busts of many of the world's famous Freemasons, including many American Masons, including Washington and Franklin and Lincoln, who was not a Mason, but again, was honored there. They had an American flag, which was still flying in the lodge. And what I've been told, that flag has been, it's been in that corner of that museum for decades. Uh, they've always had an American flag there. Uh, and to think that this was a symbol or had symbols of American dominance, but the fact that it was related to masonry was left alone. Not one statue, not one artifact dealing with the United States was ever touched or destroyed in there. And when you enter the Grand Lodge building, there's a grand foyer. And around the foyer is painted two large murals. Every recognizable face on both these murals is a Freemason. And this depicts Cuba's entire history up until that point. All the revolutions, all the battles they've had for independence from the early 1800s until they built this building around the 1930s and 40s. Every single recognizable face there is a Freemason. Leading that charge, leading that cause. Again. These, port, these murals have been there 30 years before the revolution, and they're still there today and were untouched and unscathed. The current Grand Master is Ernesto Zamora Fernandez, most worshipful Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Cuba. And he will be stepping down this year shortly as they serve three year terms in Cuba. In 20, a couple of years ago, 2018, when our Grand Master was, uh, when our uh, Hispanic Grand Master here, most worshipful Roger Quintana, Who's on the left here? In the left picture on the left, you see him. He is the gentleman with the uh, uh, on on the on the right side with the glasses. Uh, he actually met with the current grandmaster at the time, Lazaro Faustino Costa Valdez, who was the current grandmaster. He made many trips to New York City, New Jersey here, to try to again formulate recognition and get support and gain uh, uh, help and assistance, knowing that many Hispanic Americans were in many lodges here in New Jersey, New York. Uh, and again, this was to create fostering and create a new uh, wave of recognition because Cuba was really now uh, uh, kind of open and Cuban Freemason was again exploding, but they needed assistance. Now, they held uh, at the Grand Lodge building in New York, we held a, a festive uh, board or a festive event where it was sponsored by many lodges. And there, the Grand Master of Cuba gave a keynote uh, presentation, a lecture. Uh, he did it in Spanish. And one of the things he said was that the Cuban Masons were so proud, but that they just didn't have enough money to maintain their buildings. They didn't have, have enough money to be dressed formally. You know, they really took pride in, in their masonry, but unfortunately, the lack of resources and the lack of money prevented them from doing so. A lot of times, brethren would have to come in with just a t-shirt or a shirt or, or some jeans because they didn't have the money or the clothes to properly wear inside of a lodge room, as was the brethren didn't even have enough aprons or regalia for all the members. So sometimes you go to a lodge and the majority of the Masons there weren't even dressed properly because they didn't have enough aprons. Uh, and this weighed heavy on their mind because they really didn't want to disrespect the craft of Masonry. It's just they didn't have the funds or the means to get it. Most of the time, just the officers and wardens wore a full regalia. Most of the time, the other officers and members did not wear it. So in this particular night, he was explaining how this is occurring in Cuba, and they're trying to do their best to raise money and raise funds and get proper accoutrements and aprons and regalia and, and, and even just to wear a suit and tie. Uh, well, it's almost like instantaneous. Many of us took off our ties and cufflinks and tie clips, and you see me here giving my tie to the Grand Master so that he can give it to another worthy brother in Cuba so that he can attend lodge in proper attire as they really want to. Uh, well, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. And every single brother there took off their ties, took off their vests. Some of them took off their jackets and shirts. One brother took off his shoes and gave him his shoes. 
And I know this brother took the train, the subway to, to the lodge meeting. So I don't know how the hell he got back, back home barefoot. Uh, but again, it was such an overwhelming show of love and brotherly love and support uh, that the grandmaster just broke down in tears, didn't know what to say. He just could not physically, uh, it, it, you know, thank the brethren because of the, of, of, he was overcome with emotion that he actually had to buy two extra suitcases, uh, which the Grand Lodge and many members paid for so that he can actually bring all this back to his, uh, to his constituents in Cuba. Uh, and again, the new Grand Master uh, was invited to New Jersey in 2019. And we, to one of the Hispanic uh, Cuban lodges there, Sons of Liberty, which is a charter lodge in Grand Lodge in New Jersey. And there he met with us. We had a, a festive table board there for him uh, in honor of him. And again, he reiterated that many Masons in, in Cuba uh, were trying to live to the ideals and the principles. However, because of lack of means, resources, and money, it was very difficult. Uh, but again, uh, much monies were raised at uh, this time to give to the Grand Master so he can go back to Cuba and provide for those Masons who, who did not have. Now, again, I'm going to go through some of the pictures when I went to visit through Cuba, just to give you an idea. This is in the Grand Lodge building. Uh, and you see there are statues of Lincoln, other uh, statues of Washington uh, in there, and they were untouched. And those statues have been sitting there probably for about 85 years, uh, all during the revolution. But again, there was a unwritten rule that Masonic institutions, and particularly this building, were hands off. Don't touch it. Don't loot it. Don't destroy it. Leave it alone. Uh, and that's for sure, because it would never at one point at any time during the history of Fidel Castro's revolution was this building under attack. Now, there is a lot of incredible regalia there uh, in this museum, including Jose Martí, who was a Freemason and is considered the father of the Cuban people, uh, one of the founding fathers of, of, of independence of Cuba. And there he has his Scottish right regalia and his Masonic apron, which he wore. Now, the Grand Lodge building, I said, is a beautiful building. It is 11 stories tall. It's a magnificent building. Uh, many of the floors are still used by the government of Cuba. Uh, but again, it is in much disrepair. It, it needs a lot of work. It needs a lot of money. But the Brethren are doing a wonderful job restoring every piece and every corner of the building best they can to bring it back to its former glory. Uh, and in the top picture there, you see many members of the Grand Staff, which is the Grand Secretary, the Grand Treasurer, and, the, and the brothers that work in the office. Uh, diligently trying to digitize or go through all the records of Masonic history in Cuba and put it in a modern book form so that the brethren can enjoy reading this at their leisure and in lodges. Uh, some of this paperwork and documents date back several hundred years. They're very fragile, very old, uh, and they're it, it, trying to write it into a book form or value set so that the brethren can enjoy it, uh, this way preserving those, those uh, very those archives which are in much disrepair and are very fragile. While on the building, I took some incredible panoramic views because again, uh, the Cuban uh, Grand Lodge building is, was at one point one of the tallest buildings. You can see here, there's only I think two buildings that might be taller than it. Uh, and it's just showing a, a panoramic view of uh, the old uh, downtown of old Havana, Cuba. Now the brethren there in Cuba are very, very, open. They're very uh, hospitable. They just love to really uh, show, show Cuba, they show their history and, and their love, but their, their fellowship is, is second to none. They really go out of the way to make you feel at home. Uh, and at no point did I ever feel threatened walking through the streets of Cuba. And that was something that, uh, you, know, I, you know, me and my wife had jewelry on and we were walking around. And we told him, uh, I told Victor, the brother Victor, I said, you know, should I take all this off? Is, is it going to be okay? He goes, brother Moe, he goes, you will not have any issues here when you're in Cuba. Trust me on that. The fact that the government won't allow tourists to be harassed or, or assaulted or robbed, and the fact that you're with Masons, you definitely won't have any problem. Well, I was on a cruise, and I had other individuals, including my wife, my nephew, and many co-workers from where I work here in the Port Authority of New York and Jersey. So it wasn't a Masonic trip, and I didn't want to deem it as such because there were other individuals who paid a lot of money, and I didn't want to turn it into a Masonic uh, trip burdening them. Everybody wanted to do what they want. But the brothers there, uh, who I'm very close to, decided to call me and said, well, Mo, when you dock in Cuba, do not buy any of the packages or trips that you get off the ship. They're quite expensive. Uh, we're going to take care of that. And just to give you an idea, ladies and brethren, uh, just to visit the famous Tropicana nightclub and show, which is a four-hour event, was $200 American dollars for each person. So I would have had to pay $600 for me, my wife, and my nephew to attend that four-hour show. 
the brothers here arranged for a private small vehicle, a van, which held us all. And it would cost us $125 per person for the entire 36 hours we were in Havana, Cuba. And they would take us anywhere we want, including the four-hour show at the Tropicana with dinner, all the rum and drinks and cigars we can smoke to our heart's content. Uh, and they took us all over Havana, Cuba, including the famous Floridita Bar, which was the birthplace of the Dacu and the Mojito, and where Ernest Hemingway sat most days throughout the week in that corner of the bar where there's a large bronze lifelike statue of him. Uh, there he would have his famous drinks there as well. They also took us to La Bodeguita del Medio, which is another famous international bar where many famous celebrities come and they write their names on the outside of the wall. Uh, of course, I put my name there as well. They also took us to the home of Ernest Hemingway. And in the spirit of, of fellowship, again, you could see the building from the windows of the doors, but you could not enter the building. Uh, so I asked the brother, I said, is there any way I can give my phone to one of these workers here and have them take a few pictures inside? He goes, well, let me see. Let me go ask something. So he went out. He found the brother who worked there and said, listen, I have this brother from America. He wants to take pictures. Next thing I know, I was inside the building, walking around the entire home of Ernest Hemingway. And everybody outside is wondering, why is this man inside this building walking around, including my wife? Uh, and, and it's funny because my wife, they asked my wife, because you know your husband's inside the building. He goes, yeah, I'm sure the Masons arranged it for him to be in there. Because everywhere we go, they do the same thing for him. Well, I took a picture of me inside Ernest Hemingway's private office where he penned many of his most famous uh, novels in history. Now, we did get to go to the Tropicana at night. They brought us back to the ship. We got, uh, we refreshed ourselves and came, they picked us up again. Uh, and there we went to the show, which starts at around 8 o'clock and ends at midnight. Uh, well, when we got there, uh, if anybody's ever seen the movie Goodfellas, you see that when uh, uh, Lorraine Bracco and, and, and uh, Ray Liotta are walking into the club, they actually don't walk through the front door, but they go through the kitchen because there's too many people. Uh, because she's well connected and knows people. Well, when we got there, of course, there were two other ships there. Roughly 15,000 people descended in Cuba from these ships. Uh, and there was an enormous amount of people waiting to get into the Tropicana when it opened. So the brothers, we get out of the van and they've taken us to some back door, some, some, somewhere where the deliveries are made. And I'm wondering why are we going through back here? Uh, and the brothers said, well, we don't want to stand in line. We, we're, we, got, we got some people, that, friends that work here, and we're going to bring you right in quickly so you don't have to stand in line. Next thing I know, we're walking through these, through this, there's a loading docks and walking through uh, various locations. Next thing you know, we come out, we're in this beautiful outdoor uh, arena where the show is going to take place. We got front row seats, uh, the table in the front, and quickly they brought, they brought drinks and cigars flowed all night long. They actually invited us to the stage and we actually got to dance on the stage with the, with the dancers themselves. Uh, and it was a great, wonderful night. It was just incredible that uh, they were able to do this for us. Uh, and again, they really went out of their way. Uh, and ladies and brethren, to say that $125 for all of this, including many dinners and lunches and everywhere we went was really nothing. Uh, I mean, we all agreed that we were going to raise extra monies and we actually gave them, on top of the fee, we actually gave them another $1,000 in tips uh, because, I mean, we, it, that would have cost us probably $1,500 uh, per person what we were actually doing. So uh, again, this was just a thank you to them. But again, they did it without asking for any money. They also took us the next day. We had a few hours before the ship uh, took off, departed. And he asked us, what do you guys want to do the next day? Uh, and I said, well, maybe we could just ride around Cuba and just see Cuba, you know, ride around and see Cuba, everything from, from the street side. So the next morning he goes, okay, meet, meet us outside at 830, uh, sharp, and we're going to take you for a final four-hour ride around through the heart of Cuba and Old Havana. When we go outside, there to my... Uh, before my eyes were three historic old vehicles. Now we know Q was famous because since the revolution of 1959, all these old cars from the 50s have been upkept incredibly uh, by any means necessary. And he actually rented the oldest registered taxi in Cuba, which is a 1921 Ford convertible. Uh, and that was specifically for me and my nephew. And we cruised around in 81 degree weather with the top down, smoking cigars all throughout downtown and all Havana for four hours. And my wife and the other crew, other parties had two older vehicles from the fifties as well. 
And they took us to the Havana Rum Club. They took us to the Plaza of the Revolution. They took us to the capital of Cuba, the capital of the country, which is a small replica of the U.S. capital. But again, it was just a historic place to be. The fact that it was the birthplace of my parents and the fact that I was with Masons that made it so special and the fact that they left us alone for four hours for us to cruise wherever we want. And at the end, uh, it was strictly a gift from them to us. Uh, and I was really thoughtful of them to do that for us. Now, ladies and brethren, uh, I hope that what you take out of this lecture uh, and most important is that Freemasonry is a very influential organization and a very important organization. Now, Freemasonry, in my estimation, is a perfect institution made up of imperfect men. Now, Freemasonry gives you the opportunity, it gives you the tools, it gives you the implements, it gives you the allegories, it gives you the education to do what is right. And I believe that the time is always, the time is always right to do what is right. Freemasonry is a wonderful organization, probably one of the few fraternities in the world that allows for such diversity. Now, of course, again, you can choose to do the wrong thing, but Freemasonry doesn't prescribe to that. And it hasn't for centuries. Freemasonry has been behind many oppressions, many revolutions, many battles of independence, many struggles on many fronts, whether it be the civil rights movement, whether it be slavery, abolitionists, uh, you know, even in South Africa, many parts of the world, Freemasonry has always been that little thorn, that little spark in the back saying, this is not right, something should be done. Now, we're always taught not to speak politics, not to speak religion in large, and that's different. And people will ask me, well, if we're not supposed to do that, Brother Mo, then why are we engaged in, in why do we engage in these, in, in these uh, you know, struggles uh, for, for revolution and independence? I said, well, that's a, I think that's a, a significant difference. Speaking about religion and politics can always bring the worst in people, especially if you're from opposing sides. And that's different. But I do believe that it's incumbent upon Freemasons to always do what is right when the time is right. Now, it is incumbent on us to keep the peace and harmony, not just in the lodge, and that's why we don't speak politics and religion, but it's also incumbent upon us to keep the peace and harmony in the community and in the nation that we live. So if there is issues that are disrupting the peace and harmony, not just of the lodge, but of the people, the community, and the nation itself, then it is incumbent upon you as a Freemason to stand up, to do whatever is necessary to revert and, and halt that peace and harmony so that it can reign peacefully and avoid those issues. Now, ladies and brethren, I can't change the world, but if I can just change one person, then I've done my bit for humanity and I've done my bit as a Freemason. And that's the beauty of what our craft has to offer. And I believe that is the greatest core value we have, that men can meet together in the bonds of fellowship, regardless of the color of our skin, regardless what God we profess to, regardless what country we come to, what tongue we speak, regardless of our creed, of our culture, of our customs. It allows us to meet together. It allows us to disagree with each other. It allows us to even not like each other. But at the end of the day, we have to respect each other. And that's the beauty that our craft has to offer, has been offering, and I know it will continue to offer to the world in, in, in years to come. And I believe that is the greatest influence that we can afford the world. And in the world we're living in today, where it seems to be tearing ourselves apart in many parts of the world, including here in America, I think it is more important for us as Freemasons to let the world know that we can meet, we can disagree, we can have these discussions. But yet, at the end of the day, we can leave never breaking the chain of union in fellowship. And that is the greatest core value that we have today. Now, it's sad that sometimes we've grown in our charities. Uh, it's not about the spaghetti dinners and pancake breakfasts. It's not about the titles and positions and honors we accord each other. And I think in some aspect, we have gotten a little bit away from our true meaning and are focusing a lot more on that end of it. But I believe the real charity is the charity, how we treat ourselves and the charity towards the goodwill of all men. And the charity could be standing up for those who can't stand up for themselves, for those who are being oppressed, for those whose freedoms and rights are being oppressed or are being taken away. And for centuries, almost every corner of the world, Freemasonry has always been lurking in the background, ensuring that free men and free women can continue to meet and continue to have that life, those God-given rights, not just given by man, but given by God themselves, himself. And I think that's 
the true root and the two core values that we have in our fraternity. And I believe that's what we really have. And there's very few fraternities in the world that offer diversity, toleration, equality, justice, truth, as the craft of Freemasonry. It has been doing so. It is doing so today, and I have no doubt it will do so in the future. So ladies and brethren, thank you for the opportunity of being able to present this lecture. And I hope that you take the meaning and the influence that we are and who we are and spread that with the world and continue the struggles that we are living in today. May God bless all of you. May God bless all your respective nations, including the United States of America. May God bless all our veterans, past and present, all our first responders and healthcare workers, because it is by their sacrifice that we meet here today as free people and Freemasons. And most especially, may God continue to shine his blessings on the greatest fraternity in the world, Freemasonry. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Gomez. Thank you very much. Wow, can you uh, stop sharing, please? Hello, Master. Brother Gomez, can you? Oh, you dropped out. Oh, there are. Here we are. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Wow, that was uh, that was some. I think Brother Gomez, yeah, you're back. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, when I, I hit the uh, share button to stop sharing, I actually turned off my my connection. But I'm I'm back. I apologize for that. That's quite all right. Um, um yeah. I uh, wow. Uh, <laughs> that was something. That was uh, well over an hour. I think an hour and a half. But that was but that was wonderful. There was so much. Interesting information. I, I try to jot down a few questions. I'm sure all the brothers have a couple of questions. So if you don't mind, will I do a no, little question and answer? Right okay. Uh, Brother Cruz, please go ahead. Yes. Um, I thought that was wonderful. I, I had a question, um, a, a couple of questions. Um, one was um, Fidel Castro's brother was a fact a Mason. Correct or no? No. Uh, we, I, as far as I know, brother, I like to speak in, as a grand historian. I like to speak in truths, and I right now we have no truth or no factual information that either him or his brother Fidel were ever Masons. Uh, no one in Cuba wants to let me know. They all tell me the same thing. They have no idea, Mo. So I don't know for sure. Including the Grand Master himself uh, has no proof that he ever was or is. Uh, uh, again, that that was one of the rumors that circulated, and we don't know for sure, but. Uh, as a historian, I like to deal in facts and facts only, and that's fact that I, that's one fact that I cannot uh, confirm nor deny. But uh, that's one of the yep. myths that they, that were circulated that they were Masons themselves. Mm, okay, and um, I noticed uh, earlier you also stated that uh, a lot of the communist countries don't have masonry. Um, I, I thought, in my understanding, that Russia currently has a Grand Lodge operating. Uh, well, Russia, now. yes. Russia does have it, but Russia is not a communist country now. It's, it's a free, independent country to come into Russia. It's not the U.S. It's not the United Socialist Soviet Republic anymore. Okay. Uh, so once again, when it opened, when the Berlin Wall came down and, the, and Russia opened up again and became a free democratic country, they changed their flag. They changed their, their they went back to Russia and not the USSR. Uh, yes, now they do have a Grand Lodge of Russia and everything is back, including the Russian Orthodox Church, which is back in play. But during the communist regime of Lenin, and Stalin, uh, no, they were heavily persecuted, including the uh, Romanov family, which was the last family to rule in Russia, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, and Freemasonry, as it was in Germany and Italy and many other parts of, of, the, of the Europe, especially during the Renaissance and Enlightenment period, when Freemasonry was taking off in a lot of these countries like Spain and, and, and Germany and Austria, and, you know, uh, persecuted the Illuminati, they persecuted the Freemasons because they were free thinkers. Uh, and they didn't want that, you know, in order, you know, when you really look at it, how do you keep people oppressed? You keep them deaf, deaf dumb and blind. Uh, you don't want them thinking, you don't want them, you know, conspiring. Uh, you don't want them to read. You don't want them to learn how to write. You want to keep them as, 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 as in progress as possible. So you can have that control and boot over them. Uh, and that's why Freemasonry was always and always has been uh, a threat because these are free thinking men where the beggar, or 
the noble can meet together in lodge and they don't like that. That's that's not conducive to a country that has a monarchical rule or has a, a tyrannical rule or a dictatorship. You don't want that. You don't want men conspiring and free thinking without any repercussions. That's not that's not a good thing to have. Absolutely. That, that's amazing. Thank you very much. Um, I want to ask a quick question here. Uh, and this goes back to early on in your talk there. They meet and I find this really interesting. When you say they meet, they have four different types of meetings, the lodges. And yes. one is degrees, one is business, one is ed Masonic education, and the other is uh, benevolence, I guess, is for yes. charity? Or what, what do they do in that meeting? They just in benevolence, yes, they discuss uh, charity, they discuss uh, uh, assisting a brother who in distress, uh, okay. somebody who might need something. So that meeting is typically done to either help a brother or maybe uh, have an event to raise money, uh, oh, to okay. give money and charity. So that that is all geared on aiding the, the brethren and the community, whatever they can do for benevolence. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, they can be discussing what they might, you know, an issue might come up in the community or we might need money for a building or we might need money for the Masonic home. Uh, we're going to embark on on buying regalia. We're going to embark on on uh, this brother needs assistance. He's in the hospital. That's right. where they, they discuss those well, issues so in that meeting. Here's here's my wonky question. Um, there are often like well, they may not say like on a given Friday. Well, there are often five Fridays in a month. So how do they keep on? Do they just rotate through the four weeks? Or if there's a fifth Friday that month, do they do something different? Or I was kind of curious. That's interesting. He, he didn't tell me. <laughs> He didn't tell me that they worked five weeks out of the, out of the, out of the I mean, uh, on the fifth week. So uh, the fifth week might be another week to maybe do degrees if they if they if they have a overflow of brethren to do. Right. Uh, but the one inter interesting thing I left out is that in masonry now in, in in Cuba, when a when a brother becomes a Freemason or a Master Mason, the community he lives in actually comes out and has a festive uh, a festive board for them they have uh, oh, wow. parties they have a parade for these individuals because the people of cuba although they may not know much about the fraternity they realize and know the history of what freemasonry has done for their people in their country including their forefathers that it's such an honor and prestige for a brother to become a master mason that the town comes out to support and honor him on becoming a member of such an important organization which has been at the forefront of every struggle in cuba for all peoples. So even though the people themselves may not really know much about Freemasonry, they know that their history could not be written in Cuba without the help of Freemasons. You, you cannot write that history without our founding fathers who were Freemasons. Uh, and they stood for every step of the way they stood for the people of Cuba. And that's very deep for them. Uh, and I was very surprised to hear from Grandmaster how they really come out uh, after a brother's raised, how uh, the town comes out and support and celebrate that raising of that particular. That to them is like, you have reached the higher echelon. You have reached such a, uh, a, a prominent position within the island of Cuba that this, that's so respected. So, uh, again, the fifth week could actually be an uh, off week to do any business that they may have been able to catch up before. Uh, it could be a fellowship. I'm going to ask about that. I'm going to ask them next time I speak to them. Right. What happens if they get that fifth week? What do they do? Because uh, I know they told me they do meet every week of the year except Well, two you weeks. said they meet 50 weeks. So, yeah, it would make sense. I mean, no. other, the other thing that would make sense is they just roll from – one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And right. it's not right. the first Friday. It's just every fourth Friday. Right, perhaps. every fourth Friday, right. right. Oh, whatever. So, uh, by the way, before I know we have a couple of brothers had a drop, this has been great. I just want to say this. It's been wonderful. This is really ups the game on these meetings. And I've had several comments, people in the chat, and really enjoy this. And I appreciate Team Badger joining us in our little <laughs> corner of uh, masonry here. This will be posted to YouTube, so feel free uh, to share this with your friends. Those people can see it. If you have to leave, the whole thing will be out on YouTube for y'all to watch later. So, and I want to say for your presentation, there was a lot of information on the slides and I was trying to follow that and hear what you were saying. And you kind of had a lot. So there's, I want to go back and reread the slides because there's even more information there as well. I was trying to follow what you were saying along with the slides. So there's a lot of data you put out there in, in that time. So don't feel like you can't, if brothers have to leave early now, this all will be on YouTube. Uh, but I, I got one more question, but I'm gonna open it up to the floor. Anybody else got any questions? Please just uh, raise your hand or just jump in. I have a uh, 
question and Go ahead. comment? Thank you, uh, Brother Gomez. It was a really great, great talk. I was just wondering, uh, Brother Gomez, if you um, knew my uncle, a New Jersey Mason. He was known as Doc Raymond. Uh, the name sounds familiar, but he may have been before my time. I've only been a Mason 13 years. Yeah, uh, what, probably, where, where, what part was he from? Do you know what lodge he was from? He, he lived in Ridgefield, New Jersey. He was a surgeon. Um, and he, uh, Is that he was... Mosaic Lodge? Uh, Blue Stone, Mystic, Doric, Malta, Doric. Yes, I know the lodge very well. They are now in Secaucus, New Jersey. Uh, and right. matter of fact, that was the mother lodge of the first Hispanic Grand Master we ever had, Quintana. That was his mother lodge. It still is his mother lodge. Well, my uncle was um, Sherwin Raymond. He was Doc Raymond, your brother. Um, and uh, when he got out of medical school, um, my grandfather signed him right up for the Army. He was a mass, mass surgeon during the Korean War. And uh, he moved to New Jersey, um, as I say, lived in Ridgefield. And he had a uh, speedboat. Some said he had the fastest speedboat on the Hudson. <laughs> and uh, the CIA approached him. And uh, they arranged a meeting. And Raul came to his house. My uncle was also a big gun enthusiast, a gun collector. He had a huge gun collection. And uh, he arranged with Raul to sell them the, the weapons they needed for the revolution. Wow. <laughs> oh, that's very <Yeah>. <laughs> unique. Okay. And then he went down with his boat, as he did every year, to Florida, to Key West. And he actually delivered the weapons to the Cuban coast in his speedboat. And he was uh, on, on, uh, off the coast of Cuba, and the Federale ship came by. So he had a fishing rod there, and he grabbed this fishing rod, and he started pulling on it. And he had um, <clears throat> a big uh, fish. I, I forget what kind, but it was big. And it started fighting, and they just waved at him. And went on. He pulled that fish in, and he actually uh, packed it in a coffin in Cuba and sent it back to the states, and had it mounted, and it, they put it over the fireplace in his lodge, which I believe, after they merged with the other lodges, was sold and became the uh, senior center. And um, at, when he was still alive, he said that fish was still over the fireplace in the senior center. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and, uh, Brother, could you, uh, would you mind uh, exchanging emails? I would love to know a lot more history about your uncle. Maybe I can, I can, I can present something here in New Jersey. That lodge does still exist. And I believe the brethren probably won't even realize uh, all, all of what your <clears> uncle <throat> actually did. So it would be nice to talk about that. Yeah. And of course, I, I went to his evergreen and, you know, his funeral and uh, brothers were all there. Um, a lot of, a lot of support. Um, felt like the godfather. But <laughs> <laughs> and what was your uncle's first name? It was a uh, Sherwin. Sherwin Sherwin Raymond. Okay. All right. As you see, wow. my first name is my mother's maiden name. Um, I was going to be Daniel, but they were joking. I was a Raymond Frankel product, and my grandfather liked it, so it stayed, uh, <clears throat> which is how I got my name. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, so my uncle, um, as I said, he was a uh, longtime. Mason, very, uh, very involved in masonry um, down in New Jersey. And he actually uh, came up here to Massachusetts for my raising. So, um, well, I, I put my email on the uh, on the chat room. If you mind sharing yours, maybe we can talk uh, in the future with each other. And maybe you can, we can talk more about your uncle and I can find more information. And present yeah, something. Yeah. I think the brother would love to that. That would be oh, something yeah. like nice to add to this presentation. Yeah, I will. I'll send you an email. My email is my name, Raymond at Frankel.us. I have the Frankel.us domain. Okay. So, Frankel with an E, not an A. I'll All right. Thank you, brother. Okay. Um, I have brother Joyner has a question. Brother Joyner. 
Yeah, I'm here. I had to unmute. Okay. okay. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Uh, I attended Lodge in Key West, Florida, uh, probably about 10 or so years ago. And uh, uh, there were two lodges in Key West. One was the uh, English speaking lodge. The other lodge was almost entirely uh, Cuban exiles. Now, I think the original lodge I went to folded now, but I uh, just want to know if, they, uh, if you could talk about the relationship between Cuban masonry and Florida, because there seems to be a lot of Cuban masons in Florida. Well, the issue we have in Florida is that, you know, the, 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 the one issue we have overall is that Cuban exiles who left during Castro's regime tend to have a lot of resentment uh, for what he did, uh, including my parents, even though my parents left way before Castro got into power. Uh, again, a lot of my family that came after Castro have that resentment and Cubans in Florida still uh, don't like the regime. They want to see it free and open again. Uh, there were a lot of clandestine exiles who were here in New Jersey and Cuba because these are in Florida. These were the two biggest hubs for Cubans. Uh, but they have made quite enough strides to bring these into the fall like we did here in New Jersey. They're trying to uh, get these brethren to join the Grand Lodge of Florida, to join the Grand Lodge of New Jersey, to become active members. Uh, again, it's also the fact that you're looking at, at brethren who have such a unique history and, and, uh, and, and of the craft masonry in Cuba. They have a lot of pride and they still working as they were working under their charters granted by the Grand Lodge of Cuba. Uh, which is unique, but even though they're not associated with them, even though they're not with them anymore, uh, again, it's a, it's a way of of, uh, of keeping that tradition going. Uh, but slowly but surely, they are being recognized. Many are joining the fold and are joining the grand, regular Grand Lodges like in Florida and New Jersey here uh, and, and, and becoming active members in the park. But for many years, there was a lot of resentment. There was a lot of, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't recognize them, we didn't talk to them. Uh, and it's still, that, there's still some to that day today where Many refuse to join, and of course, if you don't join, you're clandestine. So, uh, and the fact that you're an exile, uh, that, that really strikes to the heart of the core because the Grand Lodge of New Jersey has recognition with the Grand Lodge of Cuba, so does New York, uh, and many other jurisdictions. And some of these exiles that are, are descendants now of those exiles in Cuba that are living in Florida seem to have that resentment. They, they still don't like that, that regime, they don't like Castro, and, and they just real dead set against it. Uh, you know, even when Obama tried to open up a little bit, a lot of Cubans in, in, in Florida hated it. They didn't want that. Uh, me personally, I didn't mind. I think it's, I think the best way to end the regime, I think the best way to see a fall of, of a communist country is to open it up and let it slowly become free. Let the people enjoy the freedoms that they would normally wouldn't have. Uh, and I think that's that's the ground root for it. But unfortunately, there's still some resentment. Uh, there's still some that don't recognize each other. Uh, but it is changing. There is a lot of... Uh, lodges in Cuba that are now being brought into the Grand Lodge and the members are being brought in and eventually, hopefully, uh, they will all be recognized, all be full members, uh, as well as Florida trying to recognize the Grand Lodge of Cuba because the Grand Lodge of Cuba recognizes some of those clandestine lodges and the Grand Lodge of Florida didn't like that. But So there's a lot of, there's a lot of issues there, but they're, they're really trying to resolve that as they resolve the issue of recognizing Prince Hall Mason, which Florida never did. That's also something that they've actually changed also. So they're, they're making strides to eventually uh, correct some of those wrongs and, and recognize all brethren for who we are. Um, I just, Father Gomez, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, I did want to, yeah, I wanted to clarify because you said you've been down there. So it sounds like the Grand Master of Cuba came and attended. So New York and New Jersey do recognize the Grand Lodge of Cuba. So you are able to actually attend meetings, correct? Yes, yes, absolutely. But the Grand Lodge of New Jersey, uh, for a short time, didn't, and we didn't okay. formally restore. New York never, ever in its history, never once stopped recognizing Cuba, okay. even during the communist regime. That's what the Grand Master told me from the Grand Lodge of New York. They always had recognition with the Grand Lodge of Cuba. Well, you mentioned you went down there to discuss recognition. That's why I was trying to clarify no, no, I, I, I didn't. I never go down. When I went down in 2019, they already had relations restored. Okay. Uh, and I can visit any lodge there, and they can visit any lodge up here. Okay. Because uh, unfortunately, you, I thought I thought you mentioned when you were there, you discussed recognition with them. No, no, I went down there strictly to visit my okay, parents' okay, birthplace okay. and as a as a holiday trip. But uh, it turned into okay. a little bit of a masonic trip. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, that's good. Okay. So then, all right. So that's why they were able to visit. So that's good. So not all Grand Lodges recognize Cuba, but some of you do. Okay, that's good. Okay, that was my question. 
Uh, Brother Joe, did you have a follow up or was there someone else who? Had yeah, a- I just wanted to uh, just uh, to make aware because, uh, you know, we have a lot of people who are not from Virginia that Virginia fully recognizes Prince Hall. Yes. For example, yes. when I was master of my lodge in 2015, we did a joint communication with the uh, Hobson Lodge, which is over by the uh, the VA hospital in Richmond. So uh, just want to clarify to people in other jurisdictions of Virginia is very recognized. We get along great. We had a, if you remember real quick, I don't, uh, they had that joint um, cornerstone laying out in yes. Warsaw, Virginia, a couple of years ago. Yes. And mm-hmm. actually, Virginia Research Lodge had a joint meeting uh, with our counterparts from Prince Hall of Virginia. They came out. This is back when it was more structured, where you basically had to go to the Grand Lodge and say, we want to have a joint meeting with our Prince mm-hmm. Hall counterpart. And they came out, about 30 brothers came out. And the most fun of that was not the presentation by the past Grand Master. It was the question and answers were basically, we were sitting on the sidelines and we stood up and asked questions back and yes. forth. And one of the questions for the Prince Hall brother was, how do you get away with wearing what you're wearing? You, you've got a loud tie. You've got a sport coat, not a suit. You're, you're in a bright green jacket. You're in a bright red. You know, They all wear black suits, white shirt, black tie, black shoes, very strict on their appearance. Yes. Every one of them, every meeting. And of course, Mason's you know, we wear whatever we want. We wear a coat and tie, but it's a sport coat. It's funny colored ties. You know, they couldn't believe how flamboyant we were in our lives. <laughs> I got a huge kick out of that. It's like, well, it, that's just how we dress, just tacky and colorful. <laughs> but that was the most fun. In fact, I'll probably have a future talk here. I'll get some Prince Hall brothers to come on here. And because Prince Hall history in, in America is it's very interesting. It gets into some serious stuff. It's a, it's a stain on our history that American Grand Lodges had to deal with. It took over 100 years to, to begin to right the ship and get things back where they should be. We never should have had that schism. But unfortunately, at the time we were founded, that's how the mentality was. And, you know, we're one of the few places in the world where masonry was, had that split between black and white. Other nations in the, you know, guys from England and European nations like, what are you talking about this Prince Hall stuff? What's the deal? Because masonry is supposed to be universal. A man's skin color should not be relevant, but in this country it was, but nobody alive today had anything to do with it. And all we can do is is make it right again. And we recognize, I think there were only eight states, eight mainstream or, or state grand lodges that don't recognize their Prince Hall counterparts. And a lot of us recognize, like, Virginia has about a dozen Prince Hall Grand Lodges. We recognize, like, Alaska, Prince Hall of Alaska. I didn't know there were enough black men in Alaska to have a lot. <laughs> but apparently there are. And we recognize the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Alaska about three or four years ago. Virginia did. So I think it will take time. But that's where the whole other discussion itself, how Prince Hall is in America. It's a, it's a whole subject matter in itself. But it's, it's, uh, I'm just glad we're moving in the right direction. That's all I well, it's true. I'm glad you. I'm glad you mentioned that. But uh, again, I, I have two lectures that I do, uh, which have become very popular: Freemasonry and the Underground Railroad, oh, and yeah. Freemasonry and the Civil Rights, uh, which is really, really in high demand. So that could be a lecture that could be one where you can present and invite both. Parts. That's what most uh, organizations do. They invite me to speak, and then they invite Prince Hall because it deals with the Civil Rights Movement and deals with the Abolitionist and the Underground Railroad Movement, which uh, touches both. You know, touches both points. I will keep that in mind, definitely. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll ask you now, uh, Brother Gomez. I'm going to be Matt. Well, I'm junior deacon again this year because of COVID, so I'll be master in four years. I would like, assuming er- the world gets straight again in the next couple of years, I really would like you to come be one of my speakers in Virginia Research Lodge my year. Okay, okay. you're what, my, what, you're if, my uh, first invite. I'm sorry. What year would that, what year would that be if you do become? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, we're in 2021. <laughs> so two, senior, three for junior, four. Uh, it'll be 2025. Be well, good. If everything goes year. right, uh, if everything is planning, I'm, I'm planning to run for the junior grand warden here in New Jersey. You run for the South. Okay. Uh, if you're elected by the brethren, then you become grand master in three years. So if everything goes right and the brethren vote for me, I will be grand master in New Jersey in 2025. <laughs> really? When? So when I can visit you as a... I could visit you as a sitting grandmaster, which I when's don't mind your, doing. When's your grand annual? Uh, it wasn't April, but because of COVID, we moved it to November of last year. 
and the grandmaster this year has extended his term one year because there is gonna there isn't gonna be a year. It's just everybody's gonna stay home. Right. Uh, so we're looking. They're looking to try to keep it in November, which has been a shift. It's been it's been in April for probably 50, 60, 70 years. Right. Uh, but they're trying to move it to November now because our lodges turn over. We have installations in December, so they're trying to keep it right. together. But again, that's still that's where we are. Uh, so this November it- we will we will have an annual meeting or a session in November, and next year. It will be in November again, and then the brother will vote to keep it in November or go back to April. But that'll be up to the brother well, to vote. On that if time. that's the case, would it be November of 2024 when you get installed? No, it will be November 2025. Okay. All right. Well, then you'll have to come to my annual then in December. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, I don't fine. matter. I don't know. I mean, I'd love to have you there as Grandmaster. But we have a few years to sort that out. I just want to go and get on, <laughs> get on your calendar now. Uh, it's unfortunate because of COVID that everything went haywire, but yes. I mean, like I said, I'm junior deacon for a second year. We just left everybody in place and our grand officers in Virginia stayed in place. Most lodges were given the choice. My blue lodge, which you see in the background here, by the way, this is Ocean View Lodge. Brother Sam Welty, our muralist, he's a professional painter. He paints murals all over Virginia Beach and he's gone to several other states to build. I thought of the murals you show there in Cuba. That's the sort of work Sam does. He does some incredible work indoors and outdoors, painting the huge murals. And he painted most of our lodge room uh, with this. But uh, they actually changed over. Sam's master again this year. It's our 100th year in Ocean View. So they wanted to actually have that year rather than just put everything on hold. It's unfortunate because it's our big centennial celebration. And half the things they wanted to do kind of got derailed because of covid so but most lodges changed hands in december the research lodges we didn't i think some of the other ones did it so covid's kind of throwing a wrench in everything and everybody's everybody's dealing with that well i did speak for your i did speak in virginia i have a lot of friends in fredericksburg lodge okay uh and i did speak there uh for the grand master actually there presently i spoke uh, uh probably about four years ago or, okay. or so I spoke there. I, I did my 9-11 presentation at his request at that lodge there. Right. Oh, yeah. A brother, uh, a brother said he was sorry he couldn't be here today. Um, he messaged me. I want to make sure I let you know. Uh, brother uh, Colin Johnston. Oh, yes. Said he couldn't be, He planned to be here for your thing. And they had a problem at the lodge. He had to run and take care of that. So. Yes, he's a good brother from Scotland. Yes, yes. Oh, good. Uh, any other brother have questions for... Uh, Brother Gomez, and for his presentation before we wrap up, we are at noon now. We're two hours in. <laughs> I don't, I don't mind. I, I usually keep this thing running two hours anyway, but it's usually just us chatting back and forth about the silly stuff. But today I had some serious content we had to absorb. <laughs> I'm gonna have to go back and watch all that. Any brother have any questions before we break? Here's your chance. Okay. Well, everybody was saying in the chat how much they enjoy this. And, and Brother Gomez, I truly appreciate you coming out and Team Badger joining us in our little corner of the internet. Uh, we we're small, but we had about 25 people at, at our high water mark here today. So I'm hoping to grow this, but we seem to have some regulars who are here every week. Uh, so definitely plan on inviting you back at some point. Um, but uh, I appreciate everyone uh, coming out today. And uh, Brother Gomez, this is a great presentation, and I'm definitely going to be sharing this on YouTube and letting people know to go check it out because they missed it. This was a great presentation. And Brother, thank you for the opportunity of presenting. Thank you to all for having me here. Stay safe, be well. And I have a five or six presentations that I've done around the world that are very high demand, and I'll send you the list. And at any time you want me, I'm always here for the brethren and the ladies anytime they want. That'd be great. I do appreciate it. Okay, brothers, thank you for coming out. Again, no meeting on the 13th, uh, Virginia Research Chapter on the 20th and a special meeting on the 21st on Sunday. But uh, I put it in the link there. Uh, Y'all know how to get a hold of me if you didn't get the link, I hope. Uh, But it is in our research group and I will be posting info about the upcoming events and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you all again for coming out. Have a good day. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.